Now again in 2020, the Brent County Planning Committee is supporting and respecting MDS regarding that same property, 3 West Harris Road. The county's planning committees have shown uniformity in making both of these extremely important decisions. I wholeheartedly agree with Mr. Hitchin that this is only an application to amend MDS. Therefore, I request that you, the council, concentrate only on this factor and not lose focus by all of the other reports that have been submitted. This is about MDS and only MDS and how the applicant wants relief from it. The two legal cases that were submitted by Mr. Hitchin in reference to MDS reductions that have occurred in Ontario are not at all similar to the cases in, in to this case in scope. Once again, do not let this information distract you nor influence your decision. You need to know how many cases were challenged throughout Ontario and how many were rejected or accepted. The legal, legal aspects of this proposal should be dealt with at the tribunal level should this situation come to that. It was surprising to see that Cahoon Engineering submitted a letter on behalf of the applicant's proposed severance application. Cahoon Engineering was the firm that dealt with the 2003 severance for the establishment of Nine West Harris Road. I do not understand how this firm can support this application as they should be fully aware of how Nine West Harris Road came to be and why no further development can happen on the West Harris Road between our farm and the Brant School Road. In addition, I wish to inform you that false information was presented in 2003 regarding our farm. And now in 2020, important information regarding the farm again has been overlooked. It baffles me how easily information can be misconstrued or manipulated to put a different light on things. In 2003, it was stated that we had no livestock on our farm due to health reasons and that our farm was up for sale as a cash crop livestock operation. None of this was true. Our farm has never been for sale. Now that we have access to computers, we are able to discover things more easily than we could before. The MDS calculations done for the, by the consulting firm for the Oosterovs ignored the one, that one type of livestock raised on our farm was pigs. In fact, swine was the largest facet of our livestock operation. Ironically, pigs are the most damning of all animals in calculating MDS. Our consultant conferred with Omafra to calculate the MDS for our farm so that the province and ourselves were on the same page. The MDS for our farm was 527 meters. At the March 3rd meeting, Mr. Oosteroff said that Omafra supported their proposal. At the February 7th meeting of the Agricultural Advisory Committee, Duke Crinklaw from Omafra conducted a training session to clarify MDS in general for the AAC members. A handout compiled by Omafra was distributed at that meeting, which clearly states the following, and I quote directly from that handout. Omafra can assist with technical aspects related to MDS, but staff do not provide comments or recommendations on the appropriateness of reducing setbacks for site-specific applications. This is considered to be the responsibility of the decision-making authority on the merits of the local circumstances. In general, the ministry does not support MBS setback. Grant County's decision-making authority falls in the hands of the Park Planning Advisory Committee and you, the elected county council. I did speak to Drew Trinklaw following the March 3rd meeting to suggest that he view the YouTube video of that meeting to see exactly how what he did say was being 
misconstrued. I am happy that Mayor Bailey and some of the councillors were present at that AAC meeting to witness the overall confusion and to hear Drew Trinkloss state that he could not provide specific information on individual situations or cases. That confusion at this meeting was reinforced when at the conclusion of the meeting, a member of the AAC committee was extremely upset with himself and indicated to me that he had voted the wrong way. I wonder if there were others in that same position. Before closing, I want to emphasize the following points. Council must protect fine prime agriculture areas for long-term agricultural uses, as stated in the provincial policy statement. The County of Brant's official plan states as part of the policy compliance, Council must ensure that agricultural operations are protected from surrounding land uses by incorporating MDS and guidelines. OMAFRA has provided direction to the planning staff to require MDS type B calculations for any lands located outside of a settlement area that is not designated agriculture. The type B calculation has a doubling factor built into it. If the staff recommended approval of this reduction, it would be in contradiction of the directions from OMAFRA. I keep hearing that there are already restrictions on our farm because of Nine West Terrace Road. If anything, it was the creation of Nine West Terrace Road and the conditions imposed at that time that are the key factors in prohibiting further development on West Harris Road. Once again, we urge the Council to uphold the Planning Advisory Committee's decision and reject this application. Your rejection would be in the best interest of all farmers in Brant County. Hasn't a hundred year old farm earned the right to protection by MBS? You met my grandson, Logan, at the March 3rd meeting. Logan has made an excellent start at farming, and I am so proud of him that he has become so engaged and has worked very hard on implementing the many facets of his farming operation. Now I will ask Logan to tell you a little bit about what he has been doing on the farm to date. Sorry, just have a moment left. Okay. How are you guys doing? Since the last time we met, I have moved to the family farm permanently. I have began a farming operation with advice, guidance, and assistance from my grandfather and neighboring farmers. I've had to prepare housing facilities for my animals and to plant and fence a five-acre pasture. Currently, I have alpacas, sheep, beef, cattle, and chickens. Each year, I plan to expand my operation. I'm thankful for the vote of confidence and encouragement that my grandfather and neighboring farmers have placed on me. Every day is a learning experience and I love it and can't wait to share this passion with the next generation. I would like to thank the Brant County Planning and Advisory Committee for your decision on March the 3rd and would urge the Brant County Council to ratify that decision this evening to help protect the future domestic food supply in this region. Once again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Logan. Um, are there any are there any questions to the presenter, either to Ms. Harris or to Logan? Any anything that's not clear? Seeing none, thank you for coming out tonight, and, and thank you for telling us what's uh, what's changed or what's different on the farm. Uh, so thank you very much, and we'll deal with this after the delegations have all spoken. So thank you very much. And Madam Clerk, if you could show that Councillor Chambers uh, signed in at uh, 13 minutes after six. And there he is, he's still here. So yep. let the minute show that it arrived. Um, going to number 4B, please. Our next presenter is Larry Davis. I believe he's zooming in. Do we have Larry on the line, Heather? Yep. Larry? Can you hear me, David? I don't know whether they're going to allow me in there. I've got you, Larry. 
Oh, sorry, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, so That's right. hi, Larry Davis, and I'm uh, addressing Council on behalf of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture as a director for the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. It's my understanding that there's a, uh, uh, a uh, application here for a severance that's uh, already been turned down and now that's coming to light again. So my, my take on this is that agriculture has been impacted and already there's almost a small village in this area which will uh, ultimately restrict agriculture and uh, one more does not make it better. So I speak on behalf of the farmers in this case. I know there's a lot of evidence pointing to the fact that it can be done, but that doesn't mean that mistakes from the past will be better in the future because one more mistake is added to it. So I humbly present to you the idea that this should be denied to be split into two lots. If there's any questions, I'd take them. Thank you, Larry. Are there any questions to, to Larry, the presenter, representing the Federation? Seeing none, thank you, Larry, for taking the time to be here tonight. Also, we received your letter in our package, too, from uh, Ms. Foss. I understand she's out west and couldn't be here tonight. Yes. Thank you for your coming out and supporting the applicant. Um, thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on now to 4C. Uh, Ted. Ted is here, I believe, isn't he? Could you give us your full name and your address, please? Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of Council. Ted Chulagy. I'm speaking this evening as President of Grant Woodlot Owners Association. I've been farming for 55 years. The last 26 certified organic. In fact, my organic inspector is out this morning. I passed with no non-compliances. A uh, few. Uh, anyhow, um, as I drive around the county, as uh, I was on Burford Township Council for three terms uh, during the 90s, uh, so I have some familiar with planning and that sort of stuff. Um, as I drive around the county, I am appalled at the number of windbreaks that have been bulldozed in the last several years, and also some of the woodlots that have been slowly diminished. People buy a bulldozer and push, push each year, and the wood, woodlot gets smaller and smaller. Um, now, why is this important? Our climate is changing, and as a volunteer weather observer, I have the numbers. I'm in a 2950 heat unit zone where I live down two miles east of Calvin on the Burford Delhi Town Line Road. Um, last year, I got 3,432 heat units. The year before, it was 3,572 heat units. That's an indication of what is happening with not only locally, but globally. Our planet is warming big time. And you see the collapse of the first ice shelf in the, the Arctic here about three weeks ago or so. Now, why is this important? Terrible reflection on ice. Woodlots have a cooling effect on the local area. And also, besides the cooling effect and moderation of climate, they also provide habitat for a variety of animals, which are stressed in this day because a lot of their natural habitat has already been destroyed. So I don't know. I can't get into the mirror to find out whether anybody else would have a problem. I couldn't uh, hear what it said. Excuse, excuse me just for a minute. Can somebody see what's going on with Councillor Coleman, please? He's not able to see what's going on or hear what's going on, but we can still hear him. I couldn't make up what was said. It's okay, you can continue. Thank you. Okay, so basically, as the Woodlawn Association is opposed to these uh, severances, and uh, for the reasons that I just mentioned, um, we should regard our, this generation should regard ourselves as custodians for future generations in protecting these areas because they are not, not only important from our societal point of view, they're important from the next two or three generations down the road. As the natives say, before we do something, we should think seven generations ahead to realize the implications of what we are doing or planning to do. So uh, basically that's it. 
as far as my presentation is concerned. Um, the Woodlot owner, uh, Brent County Woodlot Owners Association, is opposed to the severance. And the lady before me talked about minimum separation distance and so on. As a farmer, I can appreciate that also because it places a restriction. If you have nearby lots, it places a restriction on what farmers can do on their property. You don't have any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions to the presenter regarding Woodlawn? No. Robert, I can see you smiling. I know. Robert, Robert smiles a lot. He was reading when I was on council with him. Oh dear, we'll have to retrain you. Thank you. Take care. Good luck. Thank, thank you very much. Um, moving right along to 4D, Mr. Hitchon, I believe you're the next delegation with Mr. Snodgrass. Yeah, they're just moving into the room. Mr. Mayor, they're on their way. Thank you. Can you hear now, Brian? We have staff on the phone with Brian. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Hitchon. Council, um, I'm here this evening on behalf of the Use for Hop family. With me is Mr. Phillips from the Engineering and Howard Snodgrass um, from Snodgrass Consulting. Uh, it is intended that I will make the, the presentation um, and the others are available if there are questions in the area of their area of expertise. Um, I believe you're familiar with the application and with the time constraints, I won't repeat it. It's in the material before you. You have uh, Howard's uh, presentation, which starts at page 36, I believe, of your report and uh, uh, also Bob Phillips' uh, submissions. It's important to note uh, what this application is and what it is not. It's not an application to change land use. The property is already designated as rural residential in your official plan. It's zone rural residential and both lots meet all the zoning standards contained in the bylaw. Both the official plan and zoning bylaw contemplate and permit residential development. This application is not a minor variance. It's solely an application to amend the MDS factor. As well, you've got to keep in mind that this is not an application for severance. If you approve the application for this ZBA, the Oosterhoffs will still have to go to the Committee of Adjustment at which times, at which time matters such as the protection of the natural heritage feature can be dealt with. Quite frankly, those issues are not before you this evening. There's one request and that is to reduce the MDS. Nonetheless, I point out that in your material, you have an environmental impact study and their environmental planner has considered the comments of staff, staff and confirmed their opinion that the proposed development will take place outside of the appropriate buffer zone, which will ensure minimal disturbance to the forest and slope of Fairchild's Creek. As well, that report states there will be no long-term negative impact to the function of the woodland or the slope as a result of the development. Keeping in mind that the natural heritage area is down near uh, Fairchild's Creek, the land closer to West Terrace Road is indeed rural residential, both OP and zoning. Uh, I referred you to Mr. Snodgrass' plan and justification, um, which is at page 36. And I'd like to refer you in particular to page 38. And that's an, an aerial photograph that shows the area in question. It shows the already existing non-farm residences, the um, building lots that are already approved. And it is indeed in our submission, a significant uh, cluster um, of those lots. Mr. Snodgrass has confirmed to you his opinion that the application is in compliance with the Planning Act. 
the provincial policy statements, the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, and the county OP. He also points out that the EIS has confirmed compliance with the foregoing planning documents. The Arborist report has not revealed any significant timber constraints. The archaeological report has not found any significant artifacts in the Ministry of Natural Heritage, has no objection. The GRCA indicated that they have no objection to the two lot development, the GRCA. The surrounding land use, uses are similar uh, to numerous rural residential or state residential type uses in the immediate vicinity. And, and that is where I want you to look at page 38, keep that uh, in front of you, if you would. You also have um, the report or motion of the Agricultural Advisory Committee, which listened to OMAFRA and planning staff and answered, uh, who both answered questions in regard to the environmental planner's comments and the possibility of the expansion for the Harris Farm. This and your Agricultural Advisory Committee passed the motion in support of the application as there were already two residences in closer proximity at 9 West Harris Road and 16 West Harris Road. It's important to note that this application would not take any land uh, out of agricultural production. And I believe under separate cover, many of you, if not all of you, it's intended to be all of you, have seen the history of this property and the development of the plantation, not the woodlot, but the plantation that was planted there by the Drakes uh, in the 1990s. I wanted to refer you to uh, the MDS and point out that it's not legislation, it's not a regulation. Uh, it, uh, the MDS itself contemplates reducing separation distances. I would refer you to Mr. Snodgrass's analysis and opinion and that of Mr. Phillips. No one is disputing, I mean by that I mean not just us, but no one is disputing that 9 West Harris Road and 16 West Harris Road will set the goalposts for future expansion of the Harris Farm. And this is the key point in all of this. They seem to feel that granting this severance or severances or leading to that through the Committee of Adjustment will somehow constrain the future expansion of the Harris Farm. That's already set. That's already set by those other two residences. That's confirmed by your planning staff. It's acknowledged by your Agriculture Advisory Committee. It will not have an adverse impact. We have also um, pointed out that the term minor variance is a quantitative and not, uh, is a, or not a quantitative measure, but rather a qualitative one. In our submission, the impact of two additional dwellings, given what you see on page 38 from the aerial photograph, will not have a significant impact. I've also provided you with the uh, Local Planning Appeal Tribunal case law that has come out with respect to MDS in February and July of this year. I do so to show you that that tribunal is granting significant um, reductions in the MDS or saying that they are minor in nature. So I provided Brown and Brown. That was an application for minor variance. The uh, Committee of Adjustment in that case approved uh, an MDS reduction from 193 meters to 46 meters from a livestock facility and 214 meters to 32 meters for an adjacent manure storage facility. That's the order of magnitude that the tribunal approved. Committee of Adjustment approved in that instance and the uh, LPAT has seconded that. The second case is uh, Norton and Central Elgin, a case coming up just in July. The MDS, MDS requirement was 354 meters the actual separation was 72 meters. In that case, there were four other existing single detached dwellings um, proximate to the subject lands. One dwelling and possibly two and two lots were closer to the livestock building than the proposed dwelling. The residential uses proximate to the livestock facility already exists 
And that's the case here. We already have two closer residences. The planner uh, stated that uh, the adding a single detached dwelling, and I submit to you adding two in this instance, looking at the number of residences that are there, uh, would not um, uh, raise any or worsen any issues relating to non-compliance with the MDS. The planner stated that the MDS setbacks are intended to protect agricultural uses from potential conflicts associated with non-agricultural uses. And he said, given the existing relationship between the dwellings and the associated livestock facility, facility that intent was indeed maintained. And the planner stated that there would be no land use conflict and the LPAT adopted and accepted that planner's opinion. Stretch on your one minute. Thank you. It's also interesting to note that the tribunal in that case pointed out that the residential policy in the 2020 provincial policy statements has been changed somewhat from 2016. The permitted uses in the 2016 policy include limited residential development, whereas the 2020 version includes residential development, including lot creation that is locally appropriate. We submit to you that indeed the application before you is appropriate. We request that council reverse its position, not accept the recommendation of the Planning and Development Committee and pass a motion to approve this application. Two, one, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hitchin. Are there any questions to the presenter or the representative of the applicant? No questions, concerns? Thank you for coming out tonight and uh, stating your case, and we will deal with this in just a moment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Pierce, can I turn this over to you for a moment, please? You can, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Coleman that the presentations regarding this Planning and Development Committee report of March 3rd be received as information and referred to the consideration of item 5A committee reports. Thank you. Everyone's clear on what we're voting on to accept and bring it back for 5A. Those in favor? Opposed? Councillor Miller, you're opposed? Councillor Miller, can you hear me? Yes, I'm, I'm opposed, Mr. Mayor. Thank, thank you. Carried. We're going to go with 5A, please. Yeah. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Wheat that the Planning and Development Committee report of March 3rd, 2020 be approved as follows. That application ZBA 37 slash 19 slash AW received from Snodgrass Consulting Services on behalf of Lou and Irma Osterhoff for property located at 3 West Harris Road to reduce minimum distance separation requirements for the purpose of creating two new residential building lots be refused for the reasons outlined in the committee report. Thank you. Are there any questions or concerns? Councillor Gatwards first, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Are we not going to hear from our planner who did the report? It hasn't um, come back. Um, I, I guess I'm thinking that we dealt with this so long ago in March. I would like to hear from the planner um, to reinforce her report. We gave, we gave the delegations two, two opportunities to speak. And I would think we should give our staff two opportunities to speak. So I'm requesting that Amanda, um, who is the planner for this report, um, should present, there is a report on the back of our package. It came in at the last minute as an addendum item, Councillor Gatward. I'm going to let John Wheat uh, speak first, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, 
through you to committee. I was a seconder uh, for Mr. Bell's report, but I will not be supporting it when it's time to vote. Um, I encourage, in my opinion, members of council to reject this report. And if so, if it is rejected, then I will make a subsequent recommendation. If Thank it is. Thank you, Chancellor Reed. Um, I, I guess you're right, Councillor Gatward. It, it is on the addendum. If you want to hear again the, um, the report, the staff report. Staff is here to make that report. Councillor Chambers. Mr. Mayor, the, the only difficulty with uh, uh, following out uh, Councillor Gatward's uh, request is that the resolution is now before us. Yes. So uh, any uh, additional participation by anyone would be out of order in my mind, uh, my opinion. And um, that with the fact that the written reports are available and have been available for uh, quite some time, the original reports I'm talking about, and we did receive the addendum a little bit late, but uh, there's no significant differences. So uh, basically to hear staff when the resolution is before council would in my opinion be out of order and we should proceed. Thank you. Uh, at this point, we could back it up. If, if, the, if the council decides that uh, the report is important and they want to hear it again, maybe we can back things up, Councillor Pierce. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, um, I guess my thoughts on it are the fact that, um, as Councillor Coleman said, we had the report from the last meeting. We got the report again in our addendum. If there's anything new to the report that uh, Amanda would like to add to it, I would suggest that that's pertinent information we need to know. But if there's nothing changed in the report, I'm not sure why we need to go over it again. Thank you, Councillor Pierce. Councillor Chambers, are you okay with that? If there's anything new that wasn't on the re report before that she could mention it now? Councillor uh, Chambers? Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm uh, uh, in support of anything you wish to do. Thank you very much. Councillor Howes, your next, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just, uh, just one small request. And um, as, as we get to the voting part of it, part of this, if you could just please reinforce exactly how, if you, if you know what I'm talking about, like we're, we, we, it sounds like we're a, approving, we're, we're voting on whether or not we approve the rejection. And, and, and I just want to make sure it's all clear when, when we come to that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor House. We'll make it very clear when we vote. Uh, Amanda, did you have anything to tell us that wasn't on your original report or anything that's changed? Through you, Mr. Mayor, the report that was included in the addendum is the identical report from the March meeting. I have not added any additional information. Thank you, Amanda. Councillor Gatward, no one on council seems to need to um, hear it again. Councillor Coleman has his hand up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just have one question for Amanda. Yep, Amanda, That's all I have. are you still with us? I'm still here. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to uh, to 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 the to staff. Just please, yes or no. The two other residents that are closer to the Harris Farm. Well, they will in. They will also. They will make a bigger impact on the destination of the MDS right now. Is that correct? They already. What I'm trying to say is they're already in the equation. Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, it's not as simple as a yes or no answer, but those two residences are existing, yes. Is that a clear? Follow up, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Councillor Coleman. Follow up on that. So they're already now, they're, the Harris Farm, whoever owns the Harris Farm, whether it's the Harris's, whoever down the road, go to make an application to do something for a livestock operation to increase their livestock capacity and have to go to an MDS. Those two residents are already affecting it regardless whether the Ooster Ops get their two uh, proposed lots. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Mayor, that is correct. In addition, those two houses, in addition to the other existing residences as well. 
Thank you. Woman. Councillor Gatward, you were next, and then Councillor LaFerrier, please. Councillor Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the planner, it was my understanding that the MDS calculation, when there is a cluster of four homes, right now we have two, two homes. When there's a cluster of four homes, that the MDS would have to be backed out further into the farm field if the farm wanted to expand its operations. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Mayor. So the MDS guidelines have a guideline called guideline number 12, which does allow for the reduction of MDS if there's four existing houses or existing lots of record where the required MDS would be reduced to the closest of those four. But that doesn't apply in this situation because there's only within that arc that's drawn, there's only the two. So if Mr. Harris wants to expand in the future, if he has two homes there, he's got ex two existing homes. But if he wants to expand and there's four existing houses, because we allow two more, does that push the MDS calculation further out? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, in theory, it could. It all depends on the type of facility that's being posed, if, it, if it's new or an expansion or the type of livestock as well. Well, they mentioned pigs, that they, their barn is already set up for swine. They grew swine or raised swine, and that was their largest part of their operation, I think she said tonight earlier, the delegation. So if they wanted to have swine in the barn, do they have to apply with two houses because they're existing? Or once there's four houses, does the MDS go out further? Here you, Mr. Mayor. If they want to put livestock in an existing facility, they can, but if they want to a, either expand that facility or two, build a new facility, they have to do an MDS calculation. From? So it'd be from the closest residences to the proposed um, location. The closest residents that are zoned residential. Well, it's any, any use, yes. Okay, thank you for that. And, and you have said in your report, Amanda, that in your opinion, the request does not meet the provincial policy statement. And you also mentioned that it doesn't meet um, um, where is it here? The, it, yeah, staff's opinion, the proposed reduction of 52% did not maintain the intent of the MEMDS guideline. And that OMAFRA provided direction to staff. And just to be clear, OMAFRA is the Ontario Municipal Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. And they, uh, Staff was required to use a type B calculation for any lands outside of a settlement area that is not designated agriculture. And this type B calculation has a doubling factor. Now there's a disagreement on the MDS between the two different cons planning reports. One says it meets PPS, one says it doesn't. But I, um, 
would also like to ask about the environmental impact study, which was mentioned by a previous delegation member. They, they talked about the woodlot. Um, is it a significant woodlot? And how much um, forest would have to be removed to allow two homes, two driveways, two septic beds, how many would an acre be a fair estimate an acre of trees from the woodlot through uh, you mr mayor i can't speak on the amount of trees that would need to be removed to accommodate a driveway or a house or any of those features in regards to the eis uh, they did submit an eis and an arborist report our environmental planner did review it and they disagreed with the policies that were reviewed in the eis so their EIS concluded that the woodland was a significant woodland, but they did not review the correct policies in our environmental planner's opinion. So the environmental planner, the county and brand environmental planner disagreed with their conclusions. And then in regards to the PPS, um, it was my opinion that the proposed MDS reduction did not maintain at PPS because the provincial policy statements require that any, the creation of any new lots outside of a settlement area meet the MDS guidelines. And it was my opinion that if we were reducing a type B calculation by 52%, we were in, a, in essence approving a type A calculation, which would be in contradiction to direction received by OMAFRA. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Gatward. Uh, Councillor Ferrier, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you, uh, um, just a simple question. Um, for the Oosterhoffs, if we do end up <clears throat> rejecting uh, their proposal here. Uh, what are their options? Are, are they able to go to um, LPAD or something like it in order to um, appeal or go through this process um, another time um, away from the county? Through you, Mr. Mayor, they do have the option of appealing the application or they do have the option of bringing forward a new application that could be for a different proposal or have different information as well. So they do have a few different routes that they could take. And they would appeal at the provincial level? Uh, they would be appealing to the LPAT. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bell's next, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Matt. Uh, question, I think probably to Amanda. Uh, my understanding of the MDS is that it's there to prevent land use conflicts and odor complaints. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, that is correct. So then if I follow logically on, um, if we allow two new lots to be built, uh, then they must accept that the odor that is generated by the livestock that underpins the current MDS calculation is just something they have to live with. They cannot complain in the future or object through you, Mr. Mayor, it's my understanding that if bylaw receives a complaint in regards to odor noise or anything, or operations or farming operations, they do, they are obligated to follow up on it. So if these lots were created, there is the potential for complaints for the Harris farm. Oh, so I'm, I'm struggling then with that because I thought the whole purpose of NDX and why we adhere to it is that we uh, effectively agree what might be an effective level of odor that is acceptable to houses that are outside of that MDS range. Is that a misinterpretation? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So there's two different MDS types of calculation. There's a type A calculation and a type B calculation. The type A calculation is for, required for calculating the distance between agricultural designation and agricultural designation. Whereas this application, they had to do a type B, which was a calculation between agricultural and any other type of designation outside of a settlement area, which in this case was rural residential. So the type B calculation has that doubling factor built into it to help address potential um, land use conflicts such as noise and, noise and odor. So, so in simple terms, there is no limitation on the odor that can be generated by the livestock that's the basis of that MDS calculation? Through you, Mr. Mayor, that's my understanding. Okay. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I would say that, that that for me makes the difference that there is the potential that the Harris's will have livestock of a 
up to the limits that they have in their MDS calculation, which may generate odors, which new owners of these lots, should we agree them, might then come and complain. That's exactly the issue that Harris's are trying to avoid. So I'm going to side with maintaining the refusal. Are there any other questions or comments? Thank you, Councillor Chambers, for not losing your noodle over the fact that we did um, get a lot of information from Amanda. Thank you, Amanda, for being here tonight and clarifying uh, at least something for, for Councillor Bell. Uh, Councillor Council Miller wants to speak, I believe. Councillor Miller, yeah, I see him. You have to unmute yourself, Councillor Miller. Yep, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to point out that on the uh, same evening that we um, turned down this application back in March, um, the same committee approved two other lots in Scotland. Um, and it's interesting because the two lots we approved in Scotland, similar to these two, were already uh, rural residential and official plan. To me, the big difference was the ones in Scotland are, are currently being farmed. They are in agriculture, whereas these two are not. So um, I appreciate the uh, Brant Federation of Agriculture coming out, and I appreciate the Brant Woodlot Association making their comments known. I, I'd actually like to hear from them more often. Um, having said that, um, I don't see any MDS restraints Listing on these two houses that have all that aren't already um, imposed by the two existing lots. So um, I, I will not support the recommendation as presented. Um, and I, I do want to point out, Mr. Mayor, and I am concerned that there was um, undue pressure put on planning staff by some of the opponents of this application. Uh, if people have uh, opinions or they want to oppose something I think that's what we as elected representatives are there for they should come and put pressure on us um, and the only pressure staff should feel from the public or from any counselor or the mayor or yourself mayor is, is the pressure to do the right thing so I wanted to say that because I was concerned about what I felt was undue pressure I, I heard staff being described as incompetent I heard staff uh, was accused of doctoring um, official documents, which didn't turn out to be the case. So um, I do see that as a concern and I hope we can nip that in the bud for, for any future applications. I'll leave it at that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Councillor Pierce, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you if we're into to comment uh, section here. Um, I listened to everything that came out in March. I listened to everything that was stated again tonight. And, and, and I'll have to go back to something that Mr. Hitchon said. Um, this isn't about a severance. This isn't about a zoning change. I agree with that wholeheartedly. It is strictly about the MDS. And to me, that's where I have the biggest problem. <clears throat> because if we're reducing something by 52%, that in my mind, is in no way, shape, or form a minor variance of any sort. We're in essence cutting it more than half. If, if I were to relook at this and we were like 20% reduction, I might go for this, but there's no way that I can support a 52% reduction in MDS. That to me is the is the the crutch of this whole thing. As Mr. Hitchon said, we can forget about all the other stuff because he's right. It's not here for for a severance. It, it, if we approve it, we may get to the point where they're severing it down the road. But we have to look at the MDS, like he said. And to me, when you're reducing something by fifty two percent, that in my mind is unacceptable. So I will be supporting the refusal. Any other comments or concerns? Seeing none, I'm going to ask uh, the clerk to read exactly what we're voting on, please, before we call the vote. And we will have a recorded vote. The recommendation is that the Planning and Development Committee report of March 3rd, 2020 be approved, noting that that report recommends refusal of application ZBA 3719AW. It's going to be a recorded vote and I'm, I'm going first, Madam Clerk. 
Okay, Mayor Bailey. I vote to refuse the application to se to sever the properties. So you're in favor of the committee report? Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, Councillor Wheat. No. Councillor McAlpine. Yes. Councillor Laferriere. You have to unmute yourself, Councillor. Sorry, I, I hit the wrong button. Uh, yes. Councillor House. Yes. Councillor Bell. Yes. Uh, Councillor Pierce. Yes. Councillor Chambers. No. Councillor Miller. No. Councillor Coleman. Councillor Coleman, if you could unmute yourself, please. Councillor Coleman. I think it's very important we wait for Councillor Coleman's vote, please. I'm back. Councillor Coleman. back, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. No. Okay, Councillor Gatward. Yes. Okay, the motion is carried seven to four. Thank you all for putting so much time behind this. That's been a long process. And um, thank you. Moving on to number six, planning applications. Seven o'clock. It's seven o'clock. Uh, public meeting, please. Uh, Matt, if you could take this away for us, please. Thank you very much. Tonight we'll be hearing from our planning staff regarding three forms of reports. The first, Planning Act applications, initial public meeting presentations, will focus on new planning applications that have been received and are being presented to Council with the intent to provide information <clears throat> and receive public input on the application. The second, Planning Act applications, statutory public hearings, will focus on planning reports with staff recommendations for applications that have either been presented to Council before as information or are exempt from the initial presentation process. The third set of reports will focus on county initiated planning policy projects and will be received as information and in looking uh, to seek support of the associated work plans and timelines. Tonight, there are four initial public meeting presentations, two statutory public hearings, and three policy related reports for council's consideration. Thanks very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, we'll, we'll declare the public hearing open. Are, is there anyone here to represent the applicant? Yes, Mr. Mayor, Pierre Chauvin is here uh, and he is logged in and able to present the application. Thank you. Hello. You have to unmute yourself, sir. Thank you. Uh, am I allowed to speak yet, or am I waiting yeah, yeah. for Dan? No, we're, we're Mr. Waiting Mr. Mayor, for would you like staff to present first? Yeah. Uh, sure, staff could present first. Thanks, Dan. Quite a order, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Wheat. Actually, the planner should present it first. He, he, is, he, he is going to re do it right now, Councilor Wheat. He should plan it, and then if there's questions of the committee to the planner, handle them, and then the applicant presents. That's Thank right. You. Thank you. Thank you. Dan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, staff have received a, a new application for uh, the property located at 1044 Rest Acres Road. Uh, there's two parts to this application. Uh, one is a red line to the uh, previously approved uh, plan of subdivision. And the second part is a uh, amendment to the zoning bylaw. And you have a copy of my presentation in your package. So uh, some existing conditions, the official plan designates the, uh, the subject lands as urban residential. These lands are located in Paris. We are familiar with this property. Uh, we know that the, uh, the, folk, or the, the designation as well as provincial policy uh, directs uh, the focus of the development on these lands to be diverse, efficient, complete, 
uh, development patterns, which includes compact form, mix of uses, housing types, uh, which also encourage supporting active transportation. The uh, current zoning on the property, as I've identified there, uh, we have an N1-4, which is a minor institutional, uh, which also includes uh, various dwelling types, including row housing and street front fronting uh, towns. We have an RM1-20 zone, which is a residential um, multiple low density zone, which permits row houses and single detached dwellings. And we also have the existing RM3-3, which is a multiple uh, high density residential zone, which permits the apartment dwelling with the number of units, uh, maximum number of units up to 125, a building height maximum of 20 meters, as well as uh, dwelling types, row house, street fronting row house, and single detached dwellings. So the proposal before you, as I mentioned, two parts. Uh, the first part uh, identifies uh, some red light revisions proposed by the applicants. Um, and I've identified a, a couple of the highlights uh, which I've I, uh, listed on the right side of the um, of the slide. So we have uh, the addition of some some blocks, the reduction of uh, other residential blocks, um, and the addition of a of a road connection. Uh, and this this reconfiguration uh, also includes uh, an overall reduction in the, the number of units uh, proposed. So the the second portion to the application is the zoning bylaw amendment. So this is taking, uh, as a result of the layout changes, we're modifying uh, some of the size and the design or the, the zoning classification boundaries um, from uh, specifically from the institutional zone uh, to add more residential uses. We're actually reducing the, the RM3-3 from its current size uh, to permit a lower density type use as well as uh, as well as the um, permitting sorry um, sorry reducing that reducing that RM3-3 to uh, to allow for lower density which includes row house and single detached dwellings and I'll also also mention that the RM3-3 zone currently permits a mix of housing types and densities including that apartment dwelling uh, that with the that permits the the maximum height up 20 meters that exists today uh, the applicants have have are, are not requesting uh, an increase in height uh, of that apartment dwelling so the, the existing zoning will remain as is so in terms of next steps the application has been circulated to staff uh, and external agencies for comments that are currently being discussed and received and we will look to schedule a future uh, public meeting where a recommendation from staff will be made and a decision or recommended presented and a decision be made. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, are there any questions? Councillor Pierce, you're first, please. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to Dan. Um, <clears throat> just a quick question in regards to, uh, you, you speak of the numbers reducing. Well, it, it goes from the current of 763 to 876 to 735 to 878. So the the minimum number of houses is down, but the maximum is up. So I, I, I wouldn't suggest that that's actually a, a, a reduced number because it's only a couple of units, but in fact, they can actually have more now. Is that, is that am I misreading that? No, nope, you're absolutely correct. Uh, through Mr. Mayor, I will have Pierre uh, representing the applicants speak further to the the range, the ranges that they've provided. Okay, and and just a, a follow up, Mr. Mayor, I like I I don't have a, a problem with the 878, but I'm just simply saying it's it's not a reduction. I just wanted to just clarify that point. So again, I don't have a problem with that. It's just a, it's not a reduction. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Your first, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Dan. Dan, the uh, RM3-3 area on your uh, second slide, I think, or first slide, which shows it in its original uh, aerial extent, that has now been reduced uh, significantly. So I presume the 125 would also proportionally reduce as well. 
Who's going to speak to that? Uh, through, you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the that's correct. So the zone zone boundaries will be changing. So the area that they have uh, to permit or to construct that uh, apartment dwelling with the the 125 units still remains. Uh, they'll just have less area in order to construct them. So, so that that sounds odd to me, Dan. I have to say. I mean, you've reduced it quite considerably, uh, unless there's an enormous change in density of the housing or there is less parking and we know that can't happen, uh, the only logical conclusion we come to is that there must be fewer properties on that. And I would like that we examine that properly and, and come back when this, when this application comes back, that we have some clarity on that, please. Does anyone want to reply to that? I'll just add it at this point, Mr. Mayor, that uh, Pierre will, will most likely address that that concern or that question uh, through his presentation. Thanks, Dan. Okay, Councillor House, do you want to speak before Pierre does? Uh, sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to staff, uh, and just uh, I'm looking for a little bit of clarification on. Um, we, we all remember the the previous application regarding the apartment building and the number of stories, and it, it became a, a hot topic. Uh, this this is a new application that involves that property but more properties is that correct yeah uh, a question for Dan please oh for Dan okay sorry uh three mr mr mayor uh to Councillor house I believe that that's a good question I believe the subject lands are the same uh, it's a new application because uh, because it you can you can apply to rezone multiple properties under one one rezoning application. So perhaps that that might clarify that for you. Okay. All right. And perhaps in Pierre's presentation, we'll learn a little bit more. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, Pierre, if you'd like to do your presentation, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Um, I had uh, a presentation. Um, but if I can share my screen, I'd be happy to put that up. Um, someone's going to do that for you, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, you should I'll, be I'll, I'll, I'll let that someone do that for me. You'd have to share it yourself, though. It's at the bottom of your screen. Yes. Yep, I, I think he has permission. Yep, you have permission. Mr. Okay, if you can... just a second. Getting myself organized here. No hurry. Yep. There you go. There you go. Is that everybody can see that? I'm assuming. Yep. I can. <laughs> okay. Um, so I don't intend to go over a lot of the, the. Dan has done a wonderful job of summarizing the application. Um, everybody knows the uh, this application. This is a resubmission of a previous application. I guess if I were to distill it down, uh, we, are, uh, we are simply trying to modify the plan of subdivision like we were trying to do originally because of the, uh, the issues with the lot line uh, with our neighbors to the south. Uh, and uh, there's no longer an application to adjust the, the height or density of the multiple residential blocks. So, I guess right off the top, I just want to make, make that point. Um, if I can just. Uh... So just quickly going over uh, again, this is just con contextually speaking, we all know where the, the, the red line area just summarizes the extent of what we call phase three of the Granville subdivision, which is the entire plan of subdivision. The area affected by this modification is a smaller area uh, outlined in red and in, in sort of the in, inset of this uh, uh, image. Uh, this is the same area as the previous application that was before you uh, late last year. Uh, and uh, again, uh, this is all stemming from this plan of subdivision that was originally draft plan approved in 2013, which had at that time, a larger multiple residential block, which is approved for 125 units, as you've heard, with a maximum height of 20 meters. And that app, that those regulations are not changing with this application. 
Um, what's occurred through, uh, as you've heard previously, we had issues with our property boundary uh, in this location with our neighbors to the south, and that's what's precipitated uh, the change. We have to make this change regardless of, of whatever happened previously. Uh, we have to make this plan a subdivision change uh, because of this property boundary issue. And so effectively when we were doing that, we adjusted this, it's, now you can see I'll just, it was a straight line, it's now going on an angle. It's created some changes in the balance of the plan. We're now introduced uh, this sort of north south, another connection uh, to Arlington, uh, which we believe allow, helps with buffering uh, we've heard the comments before in the previous public meetings about uh, the impacts of, uh, of the, this multiple residential development on, on other homes in the area. We believe this separation allows additional separation with this road allows for it and, and transitioning with some towns on the opposite side of the road. Uh, and it is a smaller block, but the intent is to keep the same unit density of a maximum of 125 units in the same building height that was a, uh, previously approved. So again, we're not changing the zoning on that. The zoning only relates to making adjustments to the size of that block to remove it from that RM3-3 zone to reflect to, to simply provide the towns uh, that are proposed uh, bordering that multiple residential block. So sort of this is just a, a summary of on the left hand side is the existing plan. Again, you'll see that, that property boundary on the bottom of the image is nice and straight, whereas on the proposed, it's got it more of a, a, uh, an angle to it and it has, has necessitated so that these changes in any event. Um, again, the zoning uh, relates to these hatched areas. So the N14, you rezone to RM1-21, which is similar to some of the other parts of the plan of subdivision. Uh, and it should be noted that in that institutional zoned, as it stands today, currently permits townhouses as of right. So from a, from a zoning perspective, it, it, uh, it does already allow uh, that option to go with residential. Um, and then uh, the other changes and the other hatching and, and line work relate to, like I said, removing the, the former limits of the, the multiple residential block and zoning them to allow for the street funding towns that are contemplated uh, on the edges of Hutchison, what will be a new Hutchison Street and uh, Jenner Street. So I think uh, I I don't Mr. Gore, I, I hate to interrupt here, and, and Pierre, my apologies for interrupting you, but I'm getting word that the folks that are trying to watch online, there's no audio. <laughs> That's been the case all evening, sir. Um, so, okay. Mr. Pierce, we are aware of that. Um, we are recording the session, so we will be posting it afterwards if we don't get it fixed in the meantime. Okay. Uh, sorry for interrupting there, Pierre. I just I wasn't sure that they were aware of that. Yeah, Thank no you. No problem. I was watching myself on YouTube earlier, and I was watching in silence. <laughs> Okay. Um, but yes, um, this just summarizes in high, high level the, the changes that are necessitated with this modification of the plan of subdivision. And uh, although Dan was right, we, there is a, a reduction in the lower end of the unit range. There is a slight increase uh, to the upper unit range as a result of this change. Um, and uh, this is also obviously a, a, a change from the previous application uh, which had a range of 765 to 908 uh, units. Um, so those, uh, those are my comments for now, and I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that the committee or, or council may have. Sorry, thanks. Are there any questions for anyone that can hear Pierre? Here we, we're on back again. Uh, can I get a thumbs up if you can hear uh, Pierre? Yeah? Okay, we seem to be okay. Are there any questions for the presenter? Representative of the uh, applicant, Councillor Pierce? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to Pierre. Um, first of all, thank you for going back to the drawing board on this. Appreciate the efforts that you guys have done. Um, it was kind of alluded to earlier with that, uh, that the parcel where the, the building was going to be, um, <clears throat> you're still sticking with the, the 125 units on a, on a as Councillor Bell had stated, on a, on a smaller footprint of 
overall is 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 this still going to be outside parking or are you going to do underground parking uh we haven't concluded on that but i given the size i would anticipate there will be underground parking as a result of this in order to accommodate the uh the parking requirements okay thank you any other questions okay seeing seeing none are there any members of the public here tonight that want to speak well, Mr. Mayor, I have no members here to speak this evening. There's no, no members of the public? Okay, if there's nothing else then, we will declare this hearing closed. And how do you, how do you want to proceed? Councillor McAlpine. Okay. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Chambers that the presentation made regarding application PS2-09-MD and ZBA 16-20-MD received this information and referred to staff for consideration as a part of a recommendation report. Thank you. So everyone's clear we're, we're just making a motion to receive. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried 6B. Dan, I believe you're the planner I'm going to present on this application correct thank you so uh, staff have received a, a zoning bylaw amendment application this one is a little bit a little bit different than what we typically uh, are dealing with uh, the application is uh, is for property located at 402 Weir Road uh, and the applicant Holly Oaks Farm uh, care of Linda Rawlson and the staff are requesting that the application be received for information purposes. So the situation we have here, uh, existing conditions, we have the subject lands which border uh, the, the boundary of uh, the County of Brant and City of Hamilton. I've identified the subject lands in blue. Um, the, the, the subject lands are entirely within the, uh, the County of Brant. The official plan designates and zones the parcel as agricultural. Uh, the issue is that the access is through a, a shared access along Weir Road and the actual frontage is within the city of Hamilton. Uh, the, the parcel is, is not recognized to have any frontage. So there's zero meters of frontage uh, and the lot area is about uh, 21 hectares or 50 acres. Uh, the parcel currently contains an existing dwelling, uh, garage, and barn. The, the proposal gives you a little bit more detail um, where I've identified the subject lands this time in red, and I've identified two, two yellow dots. These are two dwellings utilizing that shared access in green, which that access is, uh, is historical access, which is located in the city of Hamilton. So. Uh, the issue here is the ability for that parcel at 402 to obtain a building permit. So the, the proposal is requesting to change the zoning on the subject lands from agricultural uh, to apply a, a special uh, exemption, uh, site specific provision to recognize the existing lot of record having zero meters of frontage. And this is to facilitate uh, building permits for renovations to the existing dwelling as well as for to allow the, the current owners the ability to construct or expand their farming operation. Uh, I'll also add that the requirements of the bylaw must be met before a building permit is issued for the change of use, uh, erection of, of uh, an addition or, or alteration of any building or structure. And I'll also note that uh, no new lots are being created or, or activated as part of this application, this, app, this parcel uh, already contains an existing dwelling and they were just looking to obtain permits to allow them to uh, to kind of maintain maintain those uses. Uh, in terms of uh, next steps, we'll continue to receive comments. Uh, I, I have not received comments from the city of Hamilton. I will be reaching out to them. It's important that we, that we uh, receive word from them uh, and we will be looking to schedule a future hearing and uh, look for a, a, a committee decision on this application. I'll take any questions. Thank you. Uh, before we have questions, I will declare the public meeting opened. And uh, are there any questions to Dan before we? No, are there any, is there a representative of the applicant or is the applicant here, Councillor Wheat? 
the, the applicant needs to speak before you can declare the public portion open, Mr. Mayor. All right, is there anyone here to speak, Heather? No, I have no one here to speak. Thank you, so I'm declaring the public meeting open then. Thank you, Councillor Wheat. Right. Any speakers at all for this uh, application? We're just uh, voting to receive, is that right, Dan? And I have no members to speak uh, for or against the application. Okay, thank you. I'll declare the public hearing closed then. Uh, seeing no other questions, all those in favor? Opposed? We're just receiving, thank you. I haven't presented it yet, Mr. Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Wheat. It's okay. Two by myself and seconded by um, Councillor Howes at the presentation presentation made regarding applications ZBA 20-20-DM be received as information and referred to staff for further announcements. Thank you. Are there any, any other questions then before we call the vote? Seeing none, all those in favor to receive? I'll have to get you back on the planning table, Councillor Wheat. No, I'm, just, I'm here to help you, David. That's all. You're, you're doing a great job. Thank you very much. Uh, the next one is for 38 uh, Papal Road, I believe Ryan's going to speak to it. Hello, Ryan. Hi, Mr. Mayor, can you hear me okay? I can, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the subject lands are located on the west side of Papal Road, north of Colborne Street East in Canesville. Uh, the subject lands are approximately 5.02 hectares or 12.42 acres in size and are surrounded primarily by industrial and commercial uses to the east, west, and the south. There are also several uh, existing single detached dwellings uh, dispersed in the immediate area off of Papal Road and Colborne Street East. Uh, to the north of the subject lands is the rail trail owned and operated by the Grand River Conservation Authority and beyond that are lands designated and operating in agriculture. Uh, the subject lands are situated within the primary urban settlement area of Kingsville and are designated employment in the official plan. The applicant is proposing to amend the current zoning on the subject lands from heavy industrial M3 to a special exception heavy industrial M3 zone to allow for an aggregate crushing facility as a permitted use. Uh, the applicant is proposing to construct a building to house a crusher, which they will use to recycle construction materials such as concrete and asphalt. The next steps for this application will be to receive comments from internal and external agencies, as well as members of the public. A uh, recommendation uh, report will be brought forward to council at a later date. At this time, staff is recommending that this be received for information purposes only. I understand Sarah Code is here representing the applicant and is available to speak as well. Thank you. Thank you. Do have a speaker? Who's going to speak? Yes, yes Mayor, Mem Sorry. Um, Mayor Bailey and members of council, my name is Bruno Artinozzi. I'm here representing uh, Polcan Construction, which is the uh, construction arm of Oleg uh, Real Estate Holdings, the, owners, the owner of the, uh, of the lands, uh, which is the subject of the application before you. And as um, Mr. Cummings also said, I'm joined by uh, Ms. Sarah Code, who will be speaking further on the technical issues on the matter. And we also have uh, Mr. Rob Stevens from HGC Engineering. Uh, all three of us are here to answer any questions that may come up. All right. Uh, just a little background, uh, history and pole kind construction. Before COVID, we employed between 60 and 80 full-time and part-time people, uh, all from uh, the local municipality of uh, Brant County and uh, the city of Brantford. Currently, we, um, uh, we're getting back into steady operations and uh, are rehiring. Um, our current location, uh, we have a 50,000 square foot building in the city of Brantford, which basically houses uh, our construction equipment, trucks, and our offices. But it doesn't provide us any um, facility that we are proposing before you to this evening. A major part of our operations is uh, demolition. And from that, we handle a, a substantial amount of concrete and asphalt uh, byproduct which should be and is recyclable and should uh, not be dumped in landfill. There's no facility nearby um, that can handle uh, recycling of concrete or crushing of concrete and asphalt. And we're proposing to set up uh, such a facility at, uh, at 38 Papel. 
current zoning already uh, permits various construction and heavy industrial uses. We're seeking only to, to expand it to, uh, to uh, enable us to handle uh, the byproducts that we get from our uh, everyday operations. We're committed to being a responsible uh, corporate citizen uh, towards the environment and also respectful of our adjacent neighbors, both corporate and uh, residential. Uh, in that, we're proposing a state-of-the-art facility fully enclosed with uh, up-to-date engineering technology to uh, deal with um, sound and dust emissions. We very much need this facility and we very much want to stay in um, in the location that we are uh, that we have before you. We need your support and your help in approving this so that we can do so. We don't want to look elsewhere, um, uh, which would take us out of uh, the county and uh, perhaps um, take us away from the local employment base. I think uh, that's all I need to say at this moment. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sarah Code, who will address more of the issues that have been raised by, uh, by the county staff. Sarah? Yes, good evening, Mayor and uh, members of Council. I believe my presentation is included in your addendum package. I am going to uh, skip to slide six, given uh, Ryan's presentation and Bruno's presentation as well, so that I don't repeat anything that has already been said. I would just like to uh, touch on some of the studies that were submitted in support of the application. So uh, first, HTC Engineering uh, prepared a noise impact study, which addressed potential noise impacts and mitigation requirements of the aggregate crusher itself. So Brent County adopts the noise assessment methods and the sound level limits of the Ministry of the Environment. Uh, sound emission levels of the equipment and operations proposed at the site were measured by HGC Engineering at other locations where the same equipment is currently operating. Uh, there are a number of noise control measures proposed for the crusher, uh, including enclosing the crusher in a building, specific building insulation measures, and noise barriers around uh, a portion of the site. The noise study uh, does conclude that the recommended noise control measures, um, the sound emissions from the proposed contracting and recycling operations will be within the requirements of the County of Brant noise bylaw and the limits of the Ministry of the Environment. So a portion of this, uh, there is a pond on the portion of the site and uh, a, a species at risk report was prepared to address the natural heritage features on the site. Uh, a habitat analysis indicated that there was potential for two species at risk. However, the site visit determined that potential habitat was limited to the pond and adjacent marsh. There is a 10 meter buffer to be provided around the pond and associated marsh and no development is proposed within that buffer area. And in fact, the proposed development is set back quite a far distance from, from that natural area. Uh, a siltation fence is also to be provided around the pond uh, so that no siltation goes into the pond. And tree and buffer planting will be further refined through the site plan application process in consultation with county environmental staff. There was also a uh, traffic impact memo uh, prepared and um, supported the uh, proposal. So the proposed development is expected to employ 40 people and staff will be on site in the mornings and then we'll disperse off site during the day and returning at the end of the day. So that, um, the, and then there'll be five to 10 truck deliveries uh, which will take place each day. And that, that additional traffic is not anticipated to impact the surrounding road network. So it's our opinion that, it, uh, that this proposal is consistent with the provincial policy statement as it will efficiently use land in a settlement area and will contribute to a range of employment uses. Uh, the official plan designation does permit heavy industrial uses on the site and a number of studies have been completed to support this proposal. Uh, thank you and I would be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you, are there any questions to the applicant? Councillor Coleman, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, can you tell me uh, when this uh, material arrive, will arrive on the site, 
will it be dumped inside or will it be dumped outside and then pushed inside? Um, it will be dumped on the outside and then uh, brought inside. That could create a little bit of dust and uh, noise and whatnot like that that uh, will not be migulated by the by not being inside the building. Am I correct? Uh, yes and no, sir. Um, the the product that is delivered there is are generally large clumps of concrete, uh, very little uh, uh, dust material uh, or um, uh, residue from from the demolition. We're only crushing the large concrete. We're not taking back any of the uh, fine products that are uh, generally disposed off on site on on the, uh, the, the okay. demolition site. Thank you. Councillor Miller, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a quick question uh, for you to the presenter, and I apologize if I missed this. Um, what were what are the intended hours and days of operation? Uh, as submitted, we uh, we foresee um, maximum five days a month for the crushing. It's not an ongoing daily daily thing, so we accumulate uh, certain certain amounts. And then um, we uh, commence our, our crushing. But uh, you know the, the trucks will probably be between the hours of seven in the morning uh, till maybe late as seven at night during the summer, and earlier during the winter, if at all. Uh, and crushing will, as I said, will only occur uh, maximum five days per month. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Pierce. You're next, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. And just to, to add on to what Councillor Coleman was saying there, okay, so I understand when the product is brought in, it's dumped outside and then uh, um, taken in and crushed. Um, once it's crushed, where is it stored and how is it stored? So it comes out as a, a granular uh, product. Uh, and on our uh, proposed uh, site plan, I believe we identify the, those locations where it will be uh, it'll be stored until uh, it's resold out to the marketplace and reused on a new construction. You're okay with that? Sure. Okay, any other questions? Councillor Chambers, please. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm wondering if the applicant can uh, direct the uh, committee members to another uh, operation, perhaps within uh, uh, reasonable distance that we could uh, have a look at an operation such as this uh, in, in a similar fashion. Do you know of any other air, uh, operations that do what you're intending to do within uh, a reasonable distance from here? Um, none of the operations that uh, handle concrete crushing um, are similar to ours. Most of them are, are exposed outdoors uh, with the crusher being uh, totally in the open. And generally you have sort of a, a compound facility, you know, with berms all around the property uh, and the crushing is kept inside. That's not what we're proposing. We're proposing a totally enclosed uh, crushing operation. Uh, and the only thing that will be on the exterior will be the um, the rough byproduct as it comes in and then the finished product, which is generally a, a granular A or granular B, uh, which is then put back into the marketplace. I don't know of any that is close by. Uh, the, the only facility that is I'm familiar with is in Vaughan. Um, uh, I've been told that there may be one in Vaughan, in, in Hamilton, but I don't know of one that is enclosed like ours. We're quite unique. Mm. Interesting, Kelsey Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to the delegation. Your um, Ms. Cole mentioned in her presentation that the noise levels had been measured in an operation similar to this and that they met the Ministry of Environment's requirements and our noise bylaw. If there's no operation like yours, how did you do that? How did you measure? 
if there's no completely enclosed crushing facility. Maybe I'll let Rob Stevens handle that. Okay, um, I can respond. Uh, my name's Rob Stevens. Um, I'm with HGC Engineering. We are consulting engineers in noise, vibration, and acoustics. And uh, we were retained by um, OLEC and Polcan and Construction to, to do the noise study. Um, and we did that with, uh, in, in, with some consultation with, with Ryan Cummings as to what the expectations the county would be. Um, but the simple answer to the question is that um, we measured the equipment unhoused. So uh, my understanding is it is the exact crusher that will be used on site. And it, it currently operates as a portable crusher that moves from construction site to construction site. And in that capacity, it, it doesn't have the same uh, sound level uh, criteria applicable to it under Ministry of Environment uh, requirements as one that will reside on a site in a stationary fashion. So the, um, the crusher itself and the uh, loaders and ancillary equipment that will feed it and the conveyors and so on were measured uh, on a couple of different sites with, with that exact equipment operating, but in an unhoused fashion. Um, and that, that's the input data for our analysis. Um, and, and is typical for, for any sort of predictive analysis when the site isn't built, we take that input uh, data and we use it in conjunction with computational acoustical modeling to account for the differences in the distances from the source to the neighboring residences, uh, differences in topography and orientation and site layout and so forth. And in this case, the addition of a building. So we actually started out um, the analysis by looking at what uh, would an unhoused uh, crusher be, what would sound levels from that be? And um, that was not uh, optimal for this site. So um, as, as part of the process, we looked at then moving that crusher into a building and designing the building to have adequate sound containment. So that is done on the basis of analysis that is uh, underpinned with, with measurements, but the measurements aren't direct because as, as Bruno mentioned, um, there really aren't many crushing facilities around there that are housed inside buildings. Well, thank you for that information. Um, what insulation factor did you use in the building to make the sound outside acceptable? Um, well, I have to go back and look at the specifics, but uh, essentially we, uh, we looked at the wall composition and we developed, uh, it's not a, a particularly um, elaborate or um, um, assembly. So what we found was that a, a general uh, building, um, so you know metal uh, metal skin, I believe metal skin. I think I think it's it's concrete up to a, a certain height for safety of the building with with heavy equipment working around it, uh, and and above that uh, an insulated metal building. And um, I would have to go back and look at the report, but there, there are some recommendations in there for. Uh, what that assembly needs to be in terms of minimum metal thickness uh, um, and um, fibrous insulation on the inside and so forth. There were also recommendations because there's a viewing window uh, on the side that actually faces north away from the closest residences uh, so that operators outside can see the crushing inside and so forth. So there's specifications for minimum glass thickness, uh, minimum um, assemblies for the doors and so forth, maximum sizes for the conveyor openings that come in and out. Uh, to restrict the amount of sound that can get to the outdoors. So I do have that report. Thank you for handy. your Oh, sorry to interrupt. I, I, I do have the report um, on my computer here and can take a look if you need any of the details of the assemblies. Councillor Coleman, please. You, no question? No question. Okay, any, any other questions? I have a comment, Mr. Mayor. All right. Um, I received a call from a business out in that area regarding this application and they were not too happy that they only received the notice on, on the Wednesday and they had to get their comments in by Thursday, the next day. So I don't know if there's anyone here to speak to this application from the neighborhood or not. I know we did receive one email, but I'm wondering if staff can tell us when those applications went out, because I'm concerned about um, giving the public enough time to get their presentations 
uh, together to come to a meeting like this. But they will have another opportunity, correct, at the next meeting? Is that correct? I, perhaps I can speak to this, Mr. Mayor. Right. And, and right. through, through, Mr., through the mayor to uh, Councillor Goward, um, yeah, I, I agree uh, uh, with the, uh, the community member who made that comment. Unfortunately, the notice uh, did get out a little late uh, and did not give um, the community a whole lot of time to respond. Um, Ryan did follow up with quite a few of the community members that did have some questions about this and relate a lot of the information from the application to those community members. We've also received uh, an email um, from one of the uh, concerned neighbors that has been shared with council. Uh, that was uh, <coughs> shared with council earlier today. So um, hopefully that uh, showed up and as, as an addendum to this uh, report. Um, and in, in terms of public engagement, yeah, there's, there's definitely going to be a lot more opportunity uh, to have engagement with the community uh, with this particular application. This, uh, this application does share the same kind of flavor as you'll recall with uh, Roswell, which we, we've recently dealt with. And it's uh, likely um, that it will also share the same kind of public engagement. So one of the things that we would like to do with this is uh, to schedule a virtual uh, meeting with the community, reach out to the community and have the applicant do a presentation um, similar to what they're doing tonight, just to make sure that all of the community is aware of what's being presented and that they're not missing any information prior to uh, this application coming back to council. Thank you. Is there, is there any? Is there anyone from the community here tonight to speak? Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Graham Marcotte. Welcome. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, so we own the property at 1264 Colburn Street East, which is one, uh, one neighbor uh, away from this proposed rock crusher. Uh, do you folks have the reports from HG, HGC and from GSP Group? that were supplied, uh, do you have those? Yes. Yes. So I've got a couple points here. Uh, on the rock crusher, uh, is it correct that the rock crusher is gonna be processing concrete and asphalt? That's correct. Yeah. On page uh, 33 of the report prepared by GSP Group, uh, it defines uh, well, it asks for a change to add a recycling facility and mineral aggregate resource conservation to the permitted uses of the site. So I'm going to focus on the re recycling facility part of that. Uh, it says a recycling facility shall not include on-site processing. Uh, that the facility should be used for collection, storage, sorting, redistribution, and sale of reusable goods. So I'm not sure that recycling really fits the bill on this one. Uh, so that's one of my points here, uh, that it's not gonna be, it shouldn't be permitted as per the report that you folks supplied. Uh, second main topic really is the uh, noise. So on the, HJC engineering uh, report, uh, it shows on figure five, which is a, a map, uh, scenario two and three, which I believe scenario two and three are uh, referencing the uh, maximum uh, daytime non-impulsive sound levels uh, in decibels. And if we look at that map, it gives us outlines of areas where the decibels will be uh, represented by their estimates. And, and I think we all understand estimates are, are just that, they're estimates. Um, so our property is, uh, uh, the decibels are gonna be 55 decibels when it contacts the side of our building, which is a, a retail location. Uh, it's not, we're not doing manufacturing, we're doing, we're doing retail here. And uh, the 50 decibel mark actually hits our building and follows right along the line of our building. So our building is acting as a sound barrier. 
And, uh, and then further on the table that's showing, that's justifying the report, uh, table V or five, uh, zone R4, which is the point of reception, uh, shows the uh, decibels being 48 decibels uh, during the day. But if you'll go back to figure five, and sorry for jumping around, but on figure five, location R4 is on the opposite side of our, of our building from the rock crusher. So of course it's gonna be quieter because our building will be blocking all of the sound, okay? So, and I think that an estimate that the acceptable uh, Ministry of the Environment uh, regulations on the decibel rating is 50. We're estimating 48. Uh, and I'm just showing you on figure five that really our building is gonna be in contact with a decibel rating of 55, which is outside of the reasonable uh, limits set out by the government. And I think that an estimate that's only two decimal points away is uh, a little bit too close for comfort on a uh, on an estimation basis with really no other sites that we can go and uh, accurately measure at the distance. Uh, also to that end, the measurement on figure five is uh, taken, or it's not even taken, it's estimated at 4.5 meters above grade. Uh, when I was doing some research on the government websites, uh, it suggested it should be done at 1.5 meters as well as 4.5 meters, depending on the number of stories present at the point of reception. I'll also note that our business does inside and outside business and that it's our property and that the outside of our business is going to experience much larger portion of 55 uh, decibels of estimated uh, sound pollution, really. Uh, there's a proposed berm that only extends partway up the property and that is uh, proposed to be 2.5 meters high from the grade. I would assume that's at the grade where the berm is going to be placed. Uh, I don't think that's high enough to really do anything, uh, but I'm not an engineer. Uh, uh, the dust, so the dust is a main concern and I know in talking with other uh, neighbors and with um, doing a little bit of research on the dust that's produced from grinding aggregates and different rock uh, that there's a potential for uh, pollution in the form of the silica dust. Uh, so I, I think that, and asbestos potentially, uh, I think that that really needs to be addressed and I'm not convinced that a um, two and a half meter berm is going to somehow dissuade the dust from reaching uh, people outside of the property zone. Uh, another concern that we have is that uh, you know, we have, uh, we run a, a going concern of a business here. It's, uh, we see um, thousands of people annually, or deal with thousands of people annually, and uh, we feel it'll affect our business operations and potentially our property value. And I brought this concern up to the planners and uh, they've indicated that that is outside of their scope. And so I would like to ask, uh, why that's not being considered and whose scope it's in. Um, I appreciate the, the communication from staff recently, but uh, as noted by Joan, uh, uh, thank you for, for taking my phone call. But, uh, I was concerned and still am that uh, I was only notified by mail on uh, August 26th and uh, the last date to submit was the following day for written submissions. I would have rather compiled something in writing to submit, uh, and I hope to have the opportunity to do that in the future if, uh, if there's going to be more dialogue on this subject. Thank you. Are there any questions? 
a comment, if I may, Mr. Mayor, on Mr. Yes, Marcotte, um, a submission. I, I appreciate uh, his concerns. I think they're valid. Uh, I want to point out to you, Mr. Marcotte, that uh, uh, should Council deem it fit to approve this, it doesn't mean that we can run a rough shot with this operation. It's a uh, ministry regulated. We have to comply with these sound emissions and, and dust emissions on an ongoing basis. I am not uh, I'm not the one to answer uh, the comments you made about the 50 decibels and the 48 decibels hitting your building, because uh, those may have been decibels that were measured with a uh, an unhoused operation. Our our operation is completely enclosed. So I'm, I'm going to ask uh, our consultant to look into that and provide more input there for you. But um, as far as property value is concerned, you know, we're not asking for a change of zoning. This is a contractor's yard and it permits heavy industrial. Uh, we want to introduce a, a little expanded um, use for that to, to uh, complement the heavy industrial uses permitted on the site in the application before you. But rest assured that, uh, as I said, should council see fit to approve this, we are regulated on a daily basis. And if we ever breach those, um, which I, I assure you we won't, um, we will be shut down. And that's not something that we want to invest all this, our capital and our efforts into uh, to face that situation. We intend to comply with ministry regulation. We intend to, um, uh, be respectful of your operation, as I'm sure you'll be towards ours as well. So rest assured, it's not a one-stop deal. It's an ongoing uh, conform, conforming uh, <clears throat> that we have to uh, abide by. Thank you for responding. You, I'm glad that you did. His concerns are very valid yeah. and uh, very concerning. So is there anyone else that has anything to say? Seeing none, thank you both for coming. I'm sure there's going to be lots of time for you to speak again, uh, both of you. Um, Councillor Laferriere, what do you want to do with this, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Miller um, that the presentations made regarding application ZBA 1120RC be received as information and referred to staff for consideration as part of the eventual recommendation report. Any other questions? Everyone's clear on what they're voting on? Seeing no questions, all those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. It's going to be a long process, I would think. It's a mm -hmm. situation. I wish there was a comparable uh, for us to go and see, but uh, sometimes you have to be pioneers, I guess. Councillor Gatward, you have your hand in the air, or are you? Yeah, I just wondered, um, Director Vaughn had mentioned about setting up a meeting with the neighborhood. Um, how soon will that be done and uh, where will it be? It'll have to be socially distanced or are we going to do a Zoom, Zoom meeting? Um, when will the details be coming forward on that? Uh Thanks very much. Through the mayor to Councillor Gatward, um, good question. Um, and to be honest, I'm, I'm kind of springing this on the applicant tonight. Um, so I think what we'll do is regroup after this meeting and we'll be having those conversations with, uh, with the applicant and their agent. Um, I would expect uh, that meeting to happen within the month. Um, you know, we have certain timelines. Uh, this is a zoning bylaw amendment. So we have certain timelines, 90 days in order to render a decision. So um, you know, we, we do have some time, which is great, um, but uh, we do want to respect those Planning Act timelines. So I would say we'll be having that meeting within the month. The details of that meeting, likely they will be, it will be a Zoom call similar to what we had with uh, Roswell. And um, I, that, that seemed to be a pretty functional way of um, relaying the information to the community. And um, it, it seemed to clear up a lot of concerns and questions that the community around Roswell had. So we're hoping to employ a similar technique there. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to 6D, please. Um, 
Vicano Developments, uh, 980, it's Ryan again, I believe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, subject lands are located on the east side of Rest Acres Road, west of Potroff Road and north of the Highway 403 in Paris. Subject lands are approximately 12.44 hectares or 30.73 acres in size and are currently, great, uh, currently vacant uh, with pre-grading activities underway for this larger subdivision. Subject lands are situated within the primary urban settlement area of Paris and are designated as employment within the official plan. Uh, the applicant is proposing to amend the current zoning on a portion of the subject lands from prestige industrial M1 to special exception light industrial M2 to allow for a warehouse as a permitted use, as well as to permit a reduced parking ratio of one space per 100 square meters to 0 0.45 spaces per 100 square meters. Next steps for this application will be to receive comments from internal and external agencies, as well as members of the public. Recommendation report for this uh, application will be brought forward to council at a later date. At this time, staff is recommending that this application be received for information purposes only. I understand Mr. Chris Pigeon is available to answer any questions on behalf of the applicant. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Councillor Pierce? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, um, first of all, I think something like this would look fantastic in that spot. So, so kudos for the work that's been done on this. The question I have is uh, when you go from the, the original, like the preliminary concept to the revised concept, it, it, it talks in the conclusion that um, direct site-specific plan application to prohibit loading docks. Now, if I look at the revised um, concept plan, uh, am, I, am I reading this plan incorrectly? Because to me, it appears that there's still loading docks down the side of all these buildings. So I'm just trying to understand, uh, number one, is that in fact loading docks down the side? And if so, I thought they were trying to prohibit them. So a little confusing there. If I could get somebody to clarify that for me, please. Who's going to clarify that for Councillor Pierce? Mr. Mayor, I, I can clarify that. Um, I believe in the applicant's submissions and also I, I believe in Mr. Pigeon's slides that, that were a part of this addendum. It clarifies that the loading docks uh, will be prohibited from being uh, viewed uh, from the Highway 403 corridor. Um, and again, I'd ask Chris to elaborate on this within his presentation because I think this is a key part of this application is that we're trying to maintain um, an aesthetically pleasing product here from the highway. This is a premier industrial park uh, within the county and it's important to, to, to protect that, um, that aesthetically pleasing uh, facade along the 403 corridor. Um, so what you'll see, and I, I'm not sure, um, the most up-to-date plan we received was as of last week and Dan's dealing with a site plan application uh, concurrently as well. And so I apologize uh, if the most up-to-date plan is not included, but um, what we'll see is that the, uh, that the loading spaces would be located uh, away from the 403 corridor and from the view of the traveling public along the highway. And again, if, I, if, if Chris could just comment on that um, in the context of, of his presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Miller, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Ryan. Ryan, um, currently, I think in your report, you said the lands are zoned M1, M2. And M1, M2 um, doesn't allow for warehouses, um, which hence that's why they come before planning. Why is that? Do you, do you know? Thank you, Councillor. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to clarify, I think it's important to note uh, there is a split zoning on this property, um, and I wish I could show it quickly here for the benefit of the committee, but I'll, it'll, I'll certainly make sure I delineate that within my report. There's split zoning on the site, um, and it was intended within the original zoning that was put in place on this block in the subdivision for the, um, the southerly portion of the site facing the 403 to be a prestige industrial zone. And there's very limited number of uses that are uh, that fall within the realm of uh, prestige industrial. That includes offices, uh, hotels, and, and a fairly short list. It doesn't include warehousing. Uh, the rear portion of this property, or I suppose to the north, uh, does permit warehousing within the M2 zone. Um, there is a limited list of permitted uses in the um, uh, in the site specific zoning, but what the applicant is proposing to do is to revise the zoning as a whole for the site uh, to permit the warehouse to be used uh, for the entirety of the site. So again, the M1 prestige industrial applies to a strip to the south of the lands um, 
and uh, uh, and that that what they're looking to do is to amend that M1 zoning to an M2, a site specific M2, to permit warehousing, um, so that the entire site can be used for that purpose. Um, if I could, Mister Ray, um, three to Ryan. Thank you for the detailed answer, but I still didn't get why um, why they weren't included in that zoning in the first place. Oh, okay, I, three, Mister Mayor, I apologize. Um. The, the intent within the zoning, again, uh, now I, so I wish Mr. David, Mark Davidson was here to speak to it um, at the time that he wrote his report, but um, the intent was to maintain a prestige industrial use along the corridor, highway corridor, or the facade of the highway corridor. And that's why there's a fairly limited M1 zoning strip along the southerly portion of this property um, to maintain that prestige look and feel. And the intent here uh, through consultation with the developer is that we will, we can work with them to get the warehousing component permitted uh, through this zoning application, what we were hoping for and what we think we've come to, a, we're working through a very good uh, process with them um, is to maintain that prestige industrial look and feel of the building um, while still permitting the warehousing use, which is their, their end goal. Um, and so again, I, I historically, uh, through the subdivision approvals, it was intended for a prestige industrial um, uses to be along that Sudley portion. Uh, we're looking to amend the uses and still maintain that uh, prestige look and feel of the building. Okay, thank you, Ryan. And I'm going to send you an email to follow up on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pierce. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I could just get, get back to what I was saying before about the, the loading docks there. So in the addendum, if you look at page four, uh, pardon me, page 39 of 44 of the addendum, where it shows the original preliminary concept plan. Okay, that shows me that there was a warehouse there. And all the loading docks were in the back on the north side. Okay, now we've changed the concept of it, everything that was facing the 403 on the preliminary, there was no loading docks. Now they've changed it to actually, I guess there's, there's two buildings side by side, but there's loading docks down the middle. So potentially you would be able to end, end on the, I guess it would be the east and the west side for that matter. So because of the direction the buildings are going there and the direction the loading docks, you may in fact be able to see those from the 403. So I'm, I'm again, I, I'm getting back to my question here. We're trying to prohibit the loading docks from being able to be from out of sight from the 403 from the south direction, which I appreciate immensely. But what they've done is they've, they've taken a, a concept that did that, now made two buildings so the trucks are, are down each side of the building, so they'll be seen from the 403. So I'm confused on that still, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Um, again, uh, uh, to clarify, when we look at the revised plan that uh, uh, this, this did come to us on, uh, I believe it was Friday. Um, and so the original preliminary concept plan, when we speak to the term original, that's not original to the subdivision plan, that was original to the application that came in uh, last month. Um, okay. And so the new revised plan that we're seeing on page, I believe it is uh, 39, I apologize, 42, um, is, is, the, is the latest concept plan that the applicant has come back with. I would ask Chris Pigeon to, if he could speak to that. Um, it, it would be staff's priority and preference to maintain that look and feel from the highway. And we've made that clear to the applicant since the beginning of this uh, proposal, uh, sorry, the beginning of this process for the zoning application. We would like to work with them. Uh, and find a way to get this, um, the warehousing uh, in this, uh, you know, going on this site. Um, there is opportunity to use um, both landscaping and topography to hide um, loading spaces from, or at least uh, obscure the view from the highway. Um, but it was the intent from my understanding from the original submission uh, to have the uh, loading docks screened from the highway. So I, I'd like to have the applicant speak to that as well. My apologies. And, and just to, if I could just respond to that, Mr. Mayor. Um, and, and yeah, I'm looking at, at page 42 there, Ryan. So if that's the most recent one, I think we're, we're both looking at the same, at the same drawing here. That to me, uh, potentially you're going to see the loading docks down because the loading docks are, are running north south. You're going to be able to see them from the highway. So again, I, I would prefer not to be able to see them as well, but I'll, I'll wait to see what else comes out of this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bell? Councillor Bell? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Mr. Matt. Uh, through you to Ryan. 
Um, looking at the uh, um, block plan, which I think is page 35, I think, of the uh, uh, edition, can you be clear that the, or help me understand that the uh, traffic that will approach these warehouses will be separated from any residential traffic? We're building this new roundabout at uh, what was the uh, entrance to the pit. Is that purely for industrial traffic or will it also service residential traffic? Mr. Mayor, uh, I can clarify that question uh, absolutely. Um, and it, it is a little unclear uh, in the slides that are provided by the uh, on page 35. There will be no connected traffic uh, between industrial and commercial uses, uh, specifically to Block 29 that we're dealing with here, as well as those to the south and uh, south uh, west of the subject lands. The development of uh, the residential component of this subdivision is limited to the northeast quadrant, um, whose access comes primarily off of uh, Powerline Road and Potchef Road. You'll note uh, in the plan uh, that there is actually a cul-de-sac ending off of the street uh, north of Block 29. There's no connection to Potrop Road. Um, so the intent there was to limit the interaction between any industrial users and any residential users. Um, and that would include any traffic going through Potrop Road. There, or I apologize, there will not be any industrial traffic uh, using Potrop Road. Uh, primary entrance and access would be off of uh, the roundabout off of uh, Rest Acres Road. Thank you. And one final question. Do you have any sense of how many, uh, how much traffic movement there will be? How many trucks in, trucks out on a typical day? I, I uh, unfortunately have to ask the applicant to, uh, to give you an accurate answer as to what they're anticipating. Um, I'd be interested to hear as well uh, what, uh, what, if any, uh, implications there would be based on the, uh, the concept plans that we received uh, from the initial submission to what we received uh, the other day. Um, because I think that's uh, relevant as well for our review. I think that we're ready to hear from the applicant. If there's no further questions for staff. Madam Clerk. Yeah, uh, Chris Pigeon is here to speak on behalf of the application. Thank Chris, you. Anytime you're ready, I can put up the presentation. I'm ready. Okay, hey, thank you, Mayor and members of Council. I'm Chris Pigeon. I am with GSP Group. I'm the planning consultant to Vicano, uh, who has Block 29 in the Kingwood subdivision under contract. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Boyd, for putting this up. So um, Block 29 is uh, highlighted. The, the Kingwood subdivision, as you know, is draft approved. Uh, it's dealt with by Council. They are working towards registration of the plan of subdivision and uh, Vicano has gone firm on, on this block to close on it upon registration. Also on the call with me uh, this evening is uh, Paul and Peter Vicano and um, Ya Yasin, who are all with Vicano Developments. This block, uh, just for scale purposes, is 39 acres in size. Um, so a very significant block and it takes its ac access as uh, was indicated via the cul-de-sac with direct access then out to uh, Rest Acres Road. We did, we did do a traffic study and I'll, uh, at the conclusion I'll, of my brief presentation, I'll give you some of the uh, traffic volume numbers. Next slide, please. So just to explain the split zoning, so block 29 has uh, an M1, the Prestige Industrial, and it's a 70 meter depth off, off of Highway 403. And then the M2 zone, the light industrial zone applies to the, to the majority of the block, so the balance of the block. And it has a site specific exemption to permit a truck transport terminal. And, and my understanding, because we, GSP Group did the uh, Kingwood subdivision and the rezoning application on behalf of Kingwood, my understanding when, was when the application moved forward for council's consideration, um, the, the message from Mr. Davidson, the planner of the file of the day, was that council wanted to ensure that there was some prestige industrial uses along the 403, and that would include office uses, for example. And this is, of course, the gateway to Paris. And on that basis, they split zone the property. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for a, a large user that Vicano 
has in mind for this block in that um, they need warehouse across the entire property, thus the, the application for the M2 zone. Albeit that what we're asking for in terms of site specific zoning is that the, the prestige industrial look of the building is maintained through those regulations that we've asked for. Next slide, please. So the request to Brant County is to amend the zoning to apply the M2 zone across the entirety of the site. And this will permit a warehouse distribution center. Um, it is a request for parking reduction for warehouse only. In other words, the general parking standard of the County of Brant will continue to, to apply to any and all other uses outside of warehouse. So this is a reduction only for warehouse parking. And then the, generally speaking, what we want to do is ensure that council's vision of, of prestige industrial is maintained at the Paris Gateway by prohibiting some building facilities such as loading docks along the Highway 4, uh, 403 facade, requiring other building facilities such as principal entrances along the highway and ensuring high quality building materials. Next slide, please. So very specifically, the regulations that we have applied for, for Block 29 is, uh, are, number one, that loading docks are prohibited along the south facade of the building facing the 403. Number two, that the leasing units that face the 403 ancillary uses, such as offices, have to be facing the, the Highway 403 along that south facade that there be a minimum of one principal entrance required within that south facade, that it not be a blank wall, that there be a principal entrance with our articulation and architectural features to, uh, to identify it as a principal entrance. And the, the fourth uh, is to ensure that the, the minimum facade width of the building, in other words, if you were to look at the overall width of block 29, that at least 50% of the building width is within that width of the building. So in other words, we don't want a, a long narrow building with a, a whole sea of, of asphalt and, and uh, parking areas. We want uh, over 50% of the building to be visible from that south facade, so from Highway 403. And then finally, um, the building materials for the south building elevation are to be upgraded building materials and that that building material has to occur at least every 75 meters across the facade. And those upgraded building materials include materials that have like a reflective quality, including spandrel and glass, aluminum, aluminum composite panels, ACM panels, uh, insulated metal panels, so IMP uh, decorative panels, and decorative stone or block. Next slide, please. So this was the original preliminary concept plan that was submitted with the zone change application. Um, it was proposed to be a large seven plus or minus 700,000 square foot single building. And um, what Vicano found when they went to market is that the building's too long uh, for truck loading and deliveries. So you can imagine, for example, tow motors or lift truck requirements to move the goods uh, around. Next slide, please. Uh, while they had proposed, these are the west and south building elevations showing those uh, higher quality building materials. Next slide, please. And then the, uh, the north elevation at the top of the page and then the east elevation in fact had loading docks. So that was in that preliminary uh, concept that was submitted with the zone change. Next slide. So the, the revised concept plan. So this, this is a revised concept that, that uh, Vicano has submitted to the County of Brant and is working through a site plan approval. It is a, it is a real application in that they now have uh, a user uh, for, for the building as a warehouse distribution center. They've been shortlisted from a, a company in the U.S. Um, and this, uh, this is one of, I believe, two other sites that they are looking at to shortlist uh, to bring 250 jobs to the County of Brant. So to Councillor Pierce's question, he is right 
the concepts are different in that you will be able to see the side view uh, of the loading docks, albeit that it is proposed that they would be screened by landscaping along those parking areas along the 403. So, th so that even the first loading dock at, at say the uh, southeast corner of the building on the right hand side would be screened. So you, you, you should not be able to have a, a direct view into all of those loading docks. Next slide, please. So this is a rendering of the uh, building that's contemplated. Uh, it's, it is for Eaton uh, Industries, which is from the US, um, that is, uh, sh has shortlisted for this site. Next slide, please. So uh, in conclusion, the, the zoning bylaw amendment is to ensure um, that a warehouse distribution center can be constructed on this site. We want to realize uh, uh, County of Brant's council's direction for prestige industrial uses along the 403 to, um, to provide a gateway to Paris. Uh, this zoning bylaw amendment application with the site-specific zoning regulations will direct the site plan application to again, prohibit loading docks and require offices and principal entrances along that south facade of the 403. The functionality of the buildings um, requires that there has to be loading docks on east and west sides in order to, uh, to make the uh, warehouse distribution center viable. And uh, we'd be pleased to answer any questions that council may have. Thank you. And thank you for your presentation. Uh, it's very exciting. Prospect of this is very exciting to me. Uh, Councillor Pierce, your first, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, and 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 yes, thank you for that presentation. And I agree. I think this would this would suit just fabulous. Now, just to confirm um, the the concept you had on there with Eaton. That's the if we're looking at the concept plan on page forty two, they would be in the building on the east side, correct? Um, I believe that is correct. Okay, and, I, and I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry if I missed it, but did you in fact say that you have something in mind for the building on the west side as well, or it'll be just uh, straight distribution? Um, Heather, I don't know whether Paul or Peter Vicano can respond to that. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mr. Mayor and, and Council. Thanks for the opportunity. This is Paul Vicano speaking. Um, just to answer the question, uh, Councillor Pierce, uh, at this time, there is no contemplated tenant or end user for the westerly building. Um, and you're correct, the, the Eaton building would be um, on the east or right hand building. We call it building B. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the reason we are doing the, the, the cross dock on that westerly building is because it's more conducive of logistics warehousing. And I think uh, Chris did a good job um, explaining that. But to answer the question, no, there's no one contemplated for the West Building. Okay, thank you for that. I look forward to this, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Miller, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to the presenters. Um, I, a little background, I've been pushing <laughs> ever since that was industrial to have, a, to have it look presentable, to have it look nice, because I always seen it as the gateway to Paris when they got off the 403. So having pushed for that, uh, my question, I guess I, I would address it to Mr. Vicano is um, because it sounds uh, what what the planner said was, what Chris said was um, they're, they're looking at our site, maybe another site. Um, are we, is this, is this site specific zoning that we would like to, to, so it looks nice, is that adding significantly to the, the cost of the building? Are, are we pricing ourselves out of the market, I guess is what I'm asking. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, just to answer the question. No, um, I think um, in today's sort of way of building industrial buildings, we would normally focus on using an upgraded material as you saw on the rendering. So. I don't believe that we're pricing ourselves out of the market. And it's something that we recognize um, anyway. We, we would always do our best to make these buildings look as, as nice as possible. And um, so to, to answer that question, no. I, I think um, we, we certainly don't price ourselves out of the market. And I, I can say we're up against um, competition uh, from Guelph uh, on the Hamlin Parkway 
there are some industrial uh, subdivisions that you may or may not know of that are going on. So um, we are up against uh, three other proponents. We have been shortlisted. They do prefer Brant County. Um, I think probably because to answer the question, uh, price point, our lease rates are actually significantly lower than, than Guelph. And we're able to do that because of a number of reasons. Price of land um, uh, is, is a big one. And then our ability to uh, build to scale allows our price per square foot to go down. So we are very competitive. I think you know, we're, we're probably number one, if not number two. Okay, thank you very much. And, and I know you guys can build some very nice buildings. So um, I expect nothing less from you. So thank you. To, to your point, Councillor Miller, I think the Vicanos have figured out a long time ago that it's a, it's a good idea to make beautiful buildings and you get better tenants and tenants that last longer and stay longer. Uh, so I have every, every faith in the Vicanos also for making it look exactly the way they say it's going to look. Are there any other questions to the presenter or to applicant? Councillor House? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the uh, applicants, uh, I probably to Mr. Pigeon, I guess. Uh, my curiosity question, uh, first I'll say, yeah, I agree this is an exciting opportunity from an economic development standpoint. This is exactly the kind of uh, project we like, we like to attract to our county. Um, you got my attention at 250 jobs. That's always good to hear. Um, my question is with 250 jobs, can you explain the, the detail about reducing the number of parking spaces? It seems like a significant um, reduction from, from what's intended. Uh, and I just wondered if you could explain that detail. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. Through um, Mr. Mayor in response. So if this in combination of this building is 700,000 square feet, uh, the, the, which equates to let's say 65,000 square meters. So if you take um, 250, uh, 65,000 divided by uh, 250 jobs, that equals uh, 260 square meters per job. And, and we're proposing something less than that, which is uh, 215 square meters per parking space. So as you can appreciate as a general manufacturing business of 700,000 square feet, the, the employment numbers would be higher. I think it is worthwhile noting that a warehouse distribution center, while those are direct jobs, 250 jobs, there are additional jobs, as you can appreciate through trucking operations. And I, I failed to give you these numbers, but I, I will give them to you now. So we did a traffic impact study as a part of the submission for this zone change. And we projected uh, traffic volumes of up to uh, 1,600 trips. So that's uh, both employee and truck trips in the AM and, and PM peak hours. And uh, you know that's a significant truck vo uh, volume. And uh, that shows uh, the indirect employment numbers in addition to those 250 employees. The uh, while I'm on it, uh, the, the traffic impact study evaluated three alternative scenarios for road improvements and it was concluded that, that no further road improvements would be required um, with the, the program that's in, in play right now with MTO for the various road improvements and the roundabouts. Thank you. Are there any other questions to Mr. Pigeon and or either of the Vicano boys? Councillor Gatward. Councillor Gatward, you have to take yourself off mute. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's more of a comment, Mr. Mayor. I've been um, wanting to see some more industrial um, properties developed in our county. I'm very pleased that we're finally starting on the other side of the road. Um, and I have seen many Vicano builds and in my opinion, they make wonderful buildings. So I believe this will be a, a great addition to the county and to this 
gateway location in the the um, County of Brant. I certainly hope that we can get our comments moving and accommodate the timelines for this application so that we can land this um, new business in our county. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Gatward. Any other comments? Seeing none, um, Councilor Chambers, what would you like to do with this? Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's moved by myself and seconded by Council McAlpine that the presentation be received and uh, be uh, for staff or uh, uh, <laughs> further consideration and uh, for their next staff report, which will be at our next meeting. Thank hopefully. you, Councilor Chambers. Everyone's clear on what they're voting for. We're going to receive this. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Pigeon. Thank you for the Vacanos for taking the time to speak to us tonight. Thank you, Council. Very Thank you. excited. Very excited. Thank you. 7A is uh, 365 Robinson Road. And Ryan, you're also going to be speaking on this uh, application. Mr. Mayor. Uh, the subject lands are located on the north side of Robinson Road, east of Cleaver Road in Burford. Subject lands are approximately 22.23 hectares or 54.9 acres in size and are surrounded by agricultural uses to the east, north and west. To the south and as well as the west of the subject lands is a cluster of established residential lots along Robinson Road. The subject lands are designated in the official plan as agriculture, natural heritage and rural residential. The applicant is proposing to amend the zoning on a portion of the subject lands to allow for future severance of two residential lots. The area to be rezoned is approximately 1.43 hectares or 3.53 acres. The applicant has also submitted a severance application for the proposed lots, which will go to the Committee of Adjustment following a decision by this committee on the rezoning application. The applicant is proposing lots of approximately 0 0.7 hectares or 1.72 acres with frontages of approximately 45 and 48 meters respectively along Robinson Road. Staff is of the opinion that the, that the zoning bylaw amendment has merit as it is consistent with the provincial policy statement and conforms to the general intent of the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe and the County of Brant's official plan. Staff is therefore recommending that this application be approved. I understand Mr. Bob Phillips is available to answer any questions as well on behalf of the applicant. And I'd be happy to answer any questions as well. Thank you. All right, uh, are there any questions, first of all, to staff? Seeing none, um, Mr. Phelps, you have a, you have a presentation? Uh, no, I don't, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think uh, Ryan's done it uh, very well and I'm just here to answer any questions, right. uh, questions you. you might have. Thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. Are there any questions to the presenter and to staff? Seeing none, Councillor Howes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Bell that application ZBA 15 slash 20 slash RC from Young Brothers Farms Limited uh, care of Brenda Ryder for property located at 365 Robinson Road be approved as outlined in the staff report. Thank you. Everyone's clear. There are no other questions. Seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, B, 43 Princess Street in Glen Morris. Uh, Amanda, you're going to speak to this. I am, thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. You're still here, Amanda. <laughs> I am, thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you for coming early and staying late. And you're welcome. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. The purpose of this application is to rezone the subject lands from minor institutional to special exception residential hamlet to permit additional land uses, clients and employees in a residential home occupation. The application, the, sorry, the application was originally presented in 2012 and was presented again for information in February 2020. Based on staff's understanding, the applicant is seeking to permit a home occupation, specifically including a culinary school, instruction of arts, including meditation and martial arts, and all other home occupations as defined in the zoning bylaw. 
the applicant is specifically specifically requesting to permit a maximum of 12 customers and clients, whereas the zoning bylaw only allows two. They are also requesting to permit two employees, whereas only one is permitted. The home occupation will be limited to 30% of the structure, whereas the zoning bylaw permits 25%. Should the application be approved, it will be subject to site plan control. The subject lands are designated as hamlets and villages in natural heritage and are located within the hamlet of Glen Morris. The intent of the hamlet and villages designation is to accommodate a limited amount of residential, commercial, community, and industrial services. The lands are currently zoned minor, institutional, and natural heritage. The applicant is seeking to rezone the subject lands to residential hamlet to be in line with the official plan. The zoning bylaw does allow for home occupation on lands zoned as residential hamlet subject to size restrictions. Staff are recommending limiting the home occupation to 30% of the structure, which equates, which equates to 80 square meters. Staff are recommending approval of the application, including the increased home occupation area, additional uses, and increased, incre increased client and staff permissions. I do believe the applicant is here to answer any questions and staff can answer any questions council may have as well. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Amanda before we hear from the applicant? So you know if you could make your presentation, state your name and your address please for us, just for the record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of council. Uh, my name is James Chivas. I'm uh, here as agent for the, the applicant, uh, who is Jenny Chen and she's the principal uh, owner uh, in the number company. Um, as you know, the property is at 43 Princess Street. I also live in Glen Morris at one Burnside Drive. Um, the applicant is surely appreciative of the planning report conclusions uh, that the proposed uses are appropriate in a number of ways. Um, I don't uh, intend to uh, make any long presentation. In fact, I'm really here to answer any questions that the members of council might have. And um, I'll leave it at that if I may. Thank you. Are there any uh, members of council that have questions to the delegation or the applicant? Seeing none and hearing crickets again, uh, I, will, I will say, um, that I'm also from Glen Morris and I know the property that you're speaking of. I think it's nicely tucked away and I've talked to the residents in Glen Morris and they're very excited to see it developed. Um, I think it's a, it's a good, good thing to do to that piece of property. And uh, so but with that being said, if there's no other questions, um, Councillor Miller, you would like to take this on? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, moved by myself, second by Councillor LaFerrier, that application ZBA 14 dash or slash 12 slash MD from James Chivas, agent for 1823927 Ontario Inc. for property located at 43 Princess Street, be approved as, out, as outlined in the staff report RPT dash 20 dash 91. No other questions? Everyone's clear? Call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And carried, thank you. Number eight, Jessica. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Do you, you have updates for us, policy updates? So staff are here this evening to answer any questions that council or uh, any member of the public may have regarding the on-farm diversified use project that we're hoping to initiate after this evening. Thank you. Brandon's there too? Yes, uh, Brandon so. is here. <laughs> All right, you're both here. Yeah. If a tag team, Councillor Gatwards first, please. Councillor Gatward, unmute. There you go. Thank you, yes. I have trouble getting that bar to come down from the top. We'll get so you some training. I'm, we'll I'm some sorry, training. It's, um, it's, you know, there's a delay. That's okay. My question to Jessica is, and I read this and I thought, what a great idea. Um, have you sent your report 
um, I, I know that you're going to circulate it to, um, you want to engage with the public and that's beginning tomorrow. Will you circulate this to the Grant County Federation of Agriculture and the um, agricultural groups within our community so the word can be spread that way rather than just on the website? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Gatward, yes, the staff is looking to engage with our agricultural um, community and gain some valuable feedback as far as um, the policies that we can um, hopefully bring forward given the provincial guidelines. Um, so we're excited to do that. That's great. Yeah, it seems like a real short timeline, but I guess you'll be busy, very busy. <laughs> And maybe we should put these in our customer service offices too. When people come in and pay their taxes, they'll see it. Thank you, Councillor Gatwood. Councillor Ferrier, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to staff. Uh, thank you so much for this report, and uh, I think it's great. Um, but my, my question is I know there are some farms in our community that have um, started a process uh, around um, creating spaces and buildings and then paused it because uh, basically waiting for this report and for council to make a decision on what to do about these other uses. Now, some of them are gonna run into potentially um, some um, DCs that they've spent some <laughs> significant money on DCs beforehand. And then they'll, they were waiting sort of to make sure that they're gonna be in compliance with everything we're doing. Um, do you think there's a mechanism that we could utilize? Because I, I have a feeling a number of them are gonna ask for exemptions uh, to sort of speed that process or, or streamline maybe that process uh, so so that they they come maybe recommended or, or something like that uh, for a for an exemption on I just don't want us to appear as a council as double dipping for you mr. mayor to councillor Leferrier so staff can absolutely uh, look into that further throughout the process um, Absolutely, that's gonna be something that we need to answer. That's a definitive question. We've already actually heard it um, through participating in a pre-con meeting um, regarding a possible on-farm diversified use. So um, we know that that's an active question and it's going to be something that we need to address. So we'll look to do that. Thank you. And, and I just, I think because uh, with COVID, uh, especially, I think a lot of folks in the less rural areas of the county have been discovering uh, uh, food fresh farms, uh, farm fresh foods. Uh, and uh, I, I think this is very, very welcome in, in all regards, but the timing of it is just um, stellar considering what's been happening uh, locally and worldwide. So thanks again. Any other questions for Brandon or Jessica? Uh, Councillor Miller, please. Not sure if my internet's working. Um, thank you, Mr. Ray. Uh, through you to Jessica. Um, I'm just looking at the frequently asked questions and it says in there, did you know that the um, agriculture land, the County of Brant is over 600 kilometers square and says that's 10 times the size of Prince Edward Island. Um, that's not true. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if uh, you guys could fix that. Prince Edward Island is 5,660 square kilometers. Uh, What's that? <laughs> I was just about to say, through you, Mr. Mayor, we can definitely take a look at that um, that fact that was included on the, uh, the glossy handout for the OFD use. We can definitely take a look at that. Uh, I will. <laughs> Somebody wasn't there doing their job. Um, I've been to PE, I've driven around, trust me, it's, it's, it's a lot bigger than, than that. Um, and then one other criteria you mentioned, um, like to look at, you said, you mentioned building size. I, I thought you covered them really well, water, wastewater. Um, one other thing I hope you guys kind of look at is, is traffic. Um, some of these roads are obviously still gravel. They can be extremely dusty. If, if some of these are very traffic intensive, I just hope it's looked at. Um, I know a bridge out by Councillor Gatward's ward there where um, there's a load limit, for example, on it. So just, just some of those things to be aware as far as traffic goes. So just, just those two comments. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Thank you. Councillor Wee? 
Do you, do you have your hand up? No. Okay. Councillor Bell? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Jessica. Can you explain how this fits into the uh, official plan update work that we're going to do between now and the middle of 2022? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bell. So um, this piece is actually something that we actively brought forward um, before actually doing the full comprehensive review for the official plan. And that's just because we're seeing a definitive need and a want for it within our community. Um, it's, a, it's a good news story. The guidelines are out there from the province. So we have um, some really great building blocks to, um, to take from and to hopefully make some policies that are as inclusive as possible and then make them um, conducive to Brant and our, our wants and needs for our community. So it was just something that we thought we could pull out and bring forward um, in advance and, and get it done to kind of satisfy that need and that want of the community. Okay, we're not, we're not deflecting resources away from the bigger task of updating the official plan. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I assure you that's not the case. We are absolutely <laughs> working hard on all policy projects. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, Councillor Coleman, what would you like to do with this? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Move on myself, second by Councillor Gower, the staff report RPT 20 112 on farm diversified uses. Policies updates to be approved as presented. Everyone's clear. We're going to call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? I'm carried. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank for you. Being, Jessica. Sorry to keep you so late. That's fine. We're excited to start engagement tomorrow on this. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, number eight B, uh, Jessica and Brandon. You have a summary report. There you are. You're here just to answer questions, or you, you have to. Un Unmute yourself. There you go. Yeah, sorry. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm here to answer any questions that folks have about about the report um, and the proposed policy directions that are before you. For Perfect. Councillor House is first in line to ask a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you uh, to Brandon. Um, uh, I'm excited to, to, to see this. I, I love the idea of making it um, easier, hopefully. For, for, for people to uh, consider alternative uh, uh, residential units like tiny homes and maybe garden suites. Um, my question is um, in Paris and I think St. George, you can already do additional residential units uh, as far as I know. And I'll ask you to clarify that first and then I have a follow up. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Howes. Um, it is correct, there is a form of an ARU or an additional residential unit that you are permitted in our service areas. Um, so in St. George and in Paris, um, it's only if it's wholly contained within the existing dwelling. Um, so we see that in like the basement apartment kind of um, typology, um, but that is permitted if there is that, uh, that servicing capacity available for it. Okay, thank you. And, and further, um, so, so, uh, this moving, moving, we're moving towards a goal of, of having a broader range of additional residential units that could happen in any of the communities that are fully serviced. Um, and, and I, so, so that's, that's good news. I, I, I think, um, I think there, we may have a perception issue a little bit with the public in, in that, that people don't necessarily understand what you could do already and and what you know, might be able to do in the future and and uh, also kind of the complexities that are involved in, in, in all the, these respects I I have full confidence that that your department and our communications department will 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 have a 
uh, uh, a robust approach to, to making sure people understand the, the new vision. Um, my last question is specific to the parking side of it. Um, uh, park, parking is a trumpet that I sound fairly often when it comes to <laughs> different new residential uh, opportunities. And, and I noticed in reading this that uh, one of the conditions is that if, if you add a unit to your property, there has to be an additional parking space. And I'm, I'm just raising a little bit of a flag there. And, and, and I, I know that there are streets within our community that um, that could get messed up by too much extra parking on like people exceeding their one spot and you know somebody's coming to vi you know say there's a granny suite in the backyard a granny flat in the backyard and 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 grandma lives there and and uh, somebody comes to visit grandma and grandma's car is already parked in the in her spot and now we're parking out on the street where everybody else is already parking and and so I just, I just um, re request uh, uh, continued attention to that issue, please. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ferrier, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I want to note only three questions tonight. I'm doing good. Nine go. instead of three dozen. Um, Brandon, this is great. Uh, I, I'm so impressed by the 200 plus participants in the community consultation. I thought with COVID, we'd be lucky to get 20 uh, and have to say, well, that was pretty good. Um, and I'm so happy about that. Um, the one question I, I have is, do we do any consultation with developers? And the reason I ask that is because we have, we have an affordable housing problem in our community. And this, this would be rental space. This could be, um, you know, when we keep talking about seniors who want to downsize, you know, seniors could downsize by renting these ARUs. They could, um, there's, there's a affordable housing option here that's privately owned. It's not public housing. It's not, the, the potential is there for this to, to do a lot in, in, you know, you know, hundred units like this. Anyway, my, my, my question is if we consult with developers and is there any sense from any of the developers in our community that they would be interested in, in building these into their plans or, finding ways that they can be incentivized to do so, so we can get that affordable rental uh, apartments in our community already, since we're having this development to, to not just have the $600,000 plus homes, but to have these, you know, rental units uh, th spread throughout and, and not in a giant building, but spread throughout the community in ways that make sense for folks. And I see Matt came on, so maybe Matt's going to answer this one. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, and, and through the mayor to Councilor the Ferrier. Um, it's a great question and, and it is something that we are going to be adding to our engagement process. Um, our, our department or actually our whole division, uh, we, op, uh, we hold uh, a meeting called a development information session and it's an opportunity for um, our whole department to get together with the development community to tell them about all of our new initiatives. This is definitely going to be one of those new initiatives that we um, let all of the developers know about, um, you know, and hopefully as um, you know, new projects come on board, this is something that they include in their future plans. Well, thank you, because one of the issues we've had, um, I know Steve and I have met with a ton of developers in, in our ward, and they all say, but we just don't have experience building affordable housing. And this is something where I think they have experience in this part of it, and it could serve two purposes very well. So th thanks again. Yeah. Are there any other questions for Brandon? Seeing none, Councillor Ferrier. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, let's see, 8B. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Wheat. That staff report RPT 20-114, uh, feedback summary report, additional residential units, ARUs, policy updates, be received as information. Well, thank you. Everyone's clear we're receiving. All those in favor? Post and carried. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, 8C. Hello there. Okay. There you go. You just jumped over there. You're still here. Good evening. Good evening. Now, do you have a presentation or you just want to answer questions? Uh, 
I'm here to answer questions, Mr. Mayor, and just outline the new official plan, revised consultation and engagement initiatives. Yep. Um, as indicated last month, I'll be coming every single month to update you on the official plan. And this is just to tell what we're doing for our engagement platform as everything was canceled in the spring. So we're eager and excited to move forward with everything. It just outlines everything that we're doing and also our day-to-day -day work in the background. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be pleased to answer them. How's, how's our morale doing? Is, there, is everyone still hopeful and... and uh... Uh, yeah, there's, there's great. <laughs> uh, there's a bunch of us that are in the office full time and yeah. others continue to work remote. Um, but we are an integrated team and I think we're doing very well. So thank you. Oh, that's, that's good to hear. Are there any questions for Jennifer? Uh, Councillor House. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to Jennifer. Um, and this, this may be somewhat <clears throat> for the benefit of, of people who might be tuning in to, to watch this meeting. But I, uh, this is exciting. Um, and uh, I, I just wonder, and, and I, I know there's some elements of this in, in your report, but I, I worry still about us not reaching the, the people in our community who, who are not particularly electronic communication oriented. And, and I notice in section F uh, of, of the third page of your report, you know, properly advertising events in various mediums, mailing lists, emails, social media. I'm just, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about steps we're taking to, to engage the folks who are not on Facebook, the folks that don't go to the website. Um, how do we get their attention? You know, I've seen the county, uh, rent billboard space and, and I think that's great and I've seen us do portable signs but I'm just wondering this is such an important project and it's going to be an um, important plan I, I just if you could speak a little bit more about how we reach those folks thank you all right thank you Clancer uh through you Mr. Mayor to Councillor Howes so that's definitely been a challenge with putting forward a virtual engagement platform and all of us in the county are dealing with that with different projects so we're trying to be as innovative and flexible as possible. And this has been a challenge trying to uh, look at how to engage people because as you know, you see tonight, even with technology that it's not gonna be easy. So we've got a bunch of different initiatives that we had already planned on prior and we think that some of them will still work. I mean, we had talked about going to fairs, at booths, um, going on the street so, and also putting up at posters at hockey arenas. So things have definitely changed and we're trying to be as loose and flexible as possible. So we're still renting the billboards. We're still putting up the virtual signs. Um, we're gonna have radio ads. Uh, we're even thinking of going door to door, putting flyers. And for those who don't wanna go online, cause that's gonna be based on the majority of our platform with surveys is there's always paper. And you can always drop it off because we do have many guests coming to our office at the Paris uh, customer service office every day. Um, so people are pleased always to drop in. So we'll have those things available for people that would prefer more of a hard copy platform. We are always available all day, taking calls. I get emails and all of our staff do every day. So the telephone is also a great, a great way to get uh, communication. And we do encourage that as well. So. We are trying to be loose and flexible and um, reach out to as many community members that um, because of public forums we won't be having um, to do that. So we need to go to them and obviously socially distancing uh, during COVID, but we are aware of those, uh, those issues, but thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Councillor Gatward? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to something Jennifer mentioned um, about putting up in the hockey arenas. Well, we just passed um, a motion. So the hockey arenas are going to be reopening soon um, as part of stage three and beyond. So you may still be able to do that and reach a lot of people that way grandparents that come to watch hockey, their grandkids, 
parents that don't have time to surf the web and the county website. So that's a great idea and I'm glad we're going to try to reach everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gatward. Councillor Bell, please. Yeah, thank, thanks, um, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer, I see you've got four events in uh, October, uh, two, two, two uh, weeks of back-to-back -back, uh, events. I, I hope the uh, public can, can accommodate that, that pace. It's quite a pace you're setting there. Uh, but my, my bigger question is, is there an expectation of a certain percentage of engagement with, with the public that would satisfy the province that we've done our job in reaching out and, and taking input? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bell. Um, in essence, in terms of an official plan, really the type of engagement that we have to do that will satisfy the Planning Act for the new official plan is actually under Section 26 of the Planning Act for statutory public meetings. And that's more of the initiating to do an uh, official plan, which I'll be coming hopefully later this fall. Um, and also section 17 of the Planning Act, which is also another special meeting of council to, to adopt the new official plan. Um, everything in between is sort of up to us, but obviously our consultation platform is extremely important. The province is wanting to know what the public uh, feels about our official plan. And we also have mandatory engagement such as with our indigenous communities as well. Um, so there's a bunch of different uh, uh, compartments to consultation. Uh, provincial, um, municipal with stakeholders as well in the development industry and special interest groups, our indigenous communities, and also in terms of reaching out to those that, I mean, it really is a community plan and how does the community feel about that? So, the, so everything in between is during public engagement. We have statutory and public engagement as well and then mandatory other stakeholder engagement. Yeah, thank you. But do you know of any metrics that we might- Nine o'clock. <laughs> thank you. Do you know if there are any metrics that we might be judged against uh, as to whether we've done enough of a, uh, uh, an outreach to our uh, community? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bell. There's no, in essence, metrics, um, as long as we meet our statutory requirements and the province is satisfied that we've done some public consultation and we've reported. Um, really, that's really all there is. And it's up to you as the council at the end of the day, if you are satisfied by your constituents and you have then satisfied that in terms of your council role, that you will then adopt the official plan when I bring that forward with section 17 at the end of the day. Yeah, I just don't want to get caught out in January 2022 by the province saying, well, you haven't spoken to enough people. You've only spoken to 100 when you need to speak to a, speak to a thousand. But if there's no metrics, there's no metrics. That, that's good. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Jennifer? Seeing none, we'll hand it over to Councillor Bell, please. Yeah. Um, Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Pierce that staff report RPT 20 123, new official plan revised consultation and engagement initiatives, be received as information. Everyone's clear. Vote to receive. All those in favor? Opposed? And carried. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, communications, we have none. Mr. Mayor, just, just one, there was a, an additional item there that I asked that he put on. I think it came as HC-1, I think. Okay. Yeah, and, and it really follows the uh, uh, communication I had with colleagues trying to remind them of a request that Jennifer made to us uh, about four or five months ago where she asked for a councillor's sounding board uh, to help her with the preparation of the official plan. I think just, just on reflection, we, we, I, I think this is probably the most important deliverable of our council term, because it sets the, the agenda for the next 10 years effectively. And it's a huge job, as we can all see. Um, and we're still getting provincial inputs now. And so there's a lack of clarity on a number of things still. And, and COVID has had a, a five months 
impact on all of this. It's actually uh, not enabled us to get out and do the kind of consultation that Jennifer was just talking about. So I, I think there is a, a, an imperative for us to be sure that we've got enough resources applied to this task because every time Matt or Jennifer asks the province, can we push the date back? The answer is absolutely no. So we're between a rock and a hard place here. And I think we as the council, uh, I, in my view, should do all we can to help. And I thought the idea of a, a councillor sounding board for Jennifer and the team to bounce ideas off was a good idea. And, and I think, you know, if I overstep the mark in terms of the municipal act, I apologize for that profusely. But my intent was to try and help our planning department achieve a very difficult, very uh, challenging goal in a very short time. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Does anyone want to respond to Councillor Bell? Councillor Gatward? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, our councillor sounding board coffee sessions were all canceled because of COVID. So we haven't had an opportunity. And I think that this councillor sounding board would be, any councillor can give information to staff, first of all. But I understand what Councillor Bell is trying to achieve here, and I don't think it's a bad idea. I can remember working on our past official plans, and we had the fairgrounds full of people and other facilities throughout the county full of people so we could make presentations to them. And Unfortunately, right now we can't do that. And it's very difficult. I mean, we can't have 50 people inside, but the logistics are very difficult as we all know. And so I think that the intent is to help staff. We have a lot of new staff that aren't familiar with the county like the councillors are. So I think it's a good idea. And you know, whether we had one councillor from each ward, um, that's, that doesn't constitute a quorum, but it may help. That's my comment, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gatwood. I think Mr. Bradley is going to speak to that. Thank you, uh, your workshop. Uh, can you confirm that you can hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, so the clerk and I discussed this. Uh, obviously, the concern is uh, uh, as soon as we get groups of councillors together, we run the risks of creating quorum, and then we fall into the requirements of the Municipal Act to have a, have a, have a formal council meeting and an appropriate uh, level of <coughs> public uh, record, et cetera. So we, we, there are some options for council to consider about uh, a sounding board, if you will. I think uh, Councillor Gabbard already mentioned one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions with staff. All councillors are always welcome to do that, uh, where they can put input. That's a very informal, and it's really up to the individual councillors to uh, to seek that out. Although staff could also be arranging one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, one option that we've used for a few uh, projects recently that's been quite successful are what we're calling working groups, and working groups are usually a mix of staff and uh, less than five councillors. Usually those five, less than five councillors would be appointed by council. Uh, it's not a decision making uh, environment. It's strictly, uh, uh, you know, where, where we uh, councillors could give staff advice. Staff could run things by council and take, take, uh, take comments, but staff would still be uh, making the, the determinations of what we're gonna present to council in, the, in a formal session. Um, the coffee sessions that I think had been previously thought about I think we're a good idea, but we had good turnout, better than we had anticipated, and that did get us into a, a concern about quorum. So we could continue with those, but we'd have to uh, restrict the number of councillors that could show up, maybe have two of them with a couple wards coming and then a couple more wards coming to a, a second session. So that, that but they, I think they did work well, and there was a good chance for both council to share in the discussion and for staff to get input, uh, including not only council's political input, but the social input that they offer as well. 
Another option would be to have a more robust discussion at the council meetings where we are introducing, as, as Jennifer mentioned, a, a report to each, each standing committee. Right now we're doing special council meetings, but once we, we move back to the committee cycle, we could have a more robust discussion that. Uh, it's, it's a little more complicated to have a face or a back and forth dialogue in the, in the frame of a council meeting, but it, it could take place. And the last one, and we're not recommending this, but it's something council could consider, would be to strike a formal advisory committee. It could be advised by some or all members of council, but noting that that would, be a, that would become a structured committee, it would fall under the procedural bylaw, uh, and it would make recommendations up to council. Um, you know, that we, we use advisory committees in a lot of ways, but it does uh, represent a significant uh, commitment in staff resources to, to set up an advisory committee, both around the clerk's office as well as the, uh, the, the, the necessity to, uh, to create formal documentation flowing into that advisory committee. So those are the five um, options that council could take uh, into consideration. And if you want to uh, uh, you know, task us to come back with, with an option, or if you want to, uh, to propose one this evening, uh, we can certainly help you out with that discussion. So hopefully that helps council in, in, this, uh, in this discussion. Thank you, Michael. Councillor Pierce, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to, to Michael. Um, I'd be perfectly good with just allowing you guys to, to figure out how we're going to do it. I think it's quite obvious that, that everybody wants to be involved with this and we'll leave it to staff and you guys to figure out how we do it. Whatever works best for you guys, we'll do it because I think, uh, as I say, we all want to do this. It is very important and uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. There's a lot of head shaking. Yes, Councillor Chambers, you're next. As odd as it is, I think that was exactly what I was going to say that Councillor Pierce said. Thank Almost. you. Councillor, Councillor Coleman, same thing. Yeah, Councillor Miller, please. Just, um, Michael, you ran through five options. I, I don't know if this was one of them, but what I liked in the past that I thought worked well was when um, we're doing going through the uh, strat plan. And we had uh, Glenn out, you know, and we just sat. There was a lot of interaction, a lot of dialogue, and I really liked. That. I thought I thought we got a lot done just um, doing it that way, where we had a facilitator. And, and I don't know. That, I, I thought that was a good way of doing it. Maybe we could do it this way too. Just just a thought. Just a thought. Perfect, Councillor Ferrier, please. Yeah, uh, Glenn did very good too when we did the uh, the economic development one that some of us were on. Uh, and I thought that was, so I've seen him do it in the Zoom format and it's also been really good and we get a lot of uh, measurables and deliverables out of that. So I'd, I'd sort of informally second that. Any other comments to, for Michael? To, Mr. Wheat? Yeah, <clears throat> just stay out of Jennifer's road and let her do her job. <laughs> oh boy. And, and Councillor Bell? Yeah, thanks, thanks Mr. Bell. Uh, I absolutely want Jennifer to do her job, but it's a huge job and it's become more difficult because of circumstances outside of her control. And what I'm wanting to do is think about how best we, as a council representing our community, can help to make this uh, official plan be realized by the time we, we need it, which is early 2022. It's really a very tight time frame. And Michael, you can probably speak to the need for resources and and you know if we try and do this in official council meetings we're never going to get there we're never going to give it the, the amount of uh, attention and detail review that we need to and i think i would feel feel really uncomfortable about signing off something that we haven't put an awful lot more effort into does anyone else have anything to say no i think michael Thank you, Your Worship. And so I, I think that's, that's great direction from, from Council. I think we've got some, some great ideas that we can follow. So I think, uh, based on what I've heard, we'll go away, we'll discuss this uh, over the course of the week, and then we'll, uh, we'll come up with, uh, with a strategy to engage Council efficiently uh, and, and in, in a way that's not going to, to, to slightly or even significantly uh, stall or slow down the process. As Councillor Bell mentioned, we've got a lot of work to do and a fairly tight timeline to do it in. So thank you, uh, your worship and to council for the input. Thank you. Okay, that finishes off. Oh, Councillor Gottworth. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And if I might just say, um, our customer service offices are closed. Um, not 
in Burford or Paris, but the other ones are. And our customers get a lot of information at our offices. So I would like to get some information out on our community signs. Um, as an example, there's a sign at the library in Burford. There is a sign at the library in Scotland. There's a sign at the community center in Oakland, which is still closed and the office is still closed. Um, I imagine there's a sign up in St. George somewhere where we can put these messages about the official plan so residents can see them and it doesn't cost the taxpayers a lot of money. We own those signs, we just gotta use them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gatward. Michael, you've, you've heard that. Take that back with you too, thank you. Um, that finishes off new business or other business. Takes us to number 11 in camera. I'll give that to Councillor McAlpine, please. Moved by myself and second by Council Chambers, the County of Brant Council convene in camera to discuss litigation matters affecting the municipality and advise that the subject to solicitor client privilege with the solicitor and Peter Tice, consultant in attendance, Valerie Holmes, LPAT appeal. I call the vote to go in camera. All those in favor? We're now in camera. Uh, Heather? I just confirm that the feed has been stopped. We are now out of camera and we are on to number 12 bylaws. Madam Clerk, if you could roll the cameras again, please. We're back on. Thank you. We're now on number 12 bylaws. I believe Councilor. Am I on TV? Okay. You're on TV, Councillor <laughs> Miller. Smile. Yep. Film on 11. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Gatward, that bylaws 87 20 to 91 20 be read the first time. All those in favor? Second time, please, Councillor Miller. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Gatward, that bylaw numbers 87 20 to 91 20 be read a second time and all clauses and preambles be adopted. Thank you. Are there any questions for Councillor Miller regarding any of the bylaws? Seeing none, if you could read them for the third time, please, Councillor Miller. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Gatwood. Minute, that bylaw minute, we had to vote minute. first. Oh, sorry, we have to vote. All those in favor? Do you have questions, Councillor Pierce, or just wanting to nope, vote? Nope, just that we needed to vote on that first. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Miller, I'm sorry. For the third time, please. Okay, uh, they moved by myself and seconded by Councilor Gatward that bylaws 87 20 to 91 20 be read a third time, passed, signed, and executed. Thank you. All those in favor? Third reading. Signed, sealed, and delivered. Number 13 is the next meeting, September 15th. Move to adjourn. I think we should have the meeting start at 2 30 in the afternoon. <laughs> With cocktails. With cocktails. Anyway, I it'll teach. be either the 15th or the call of the chair. Thank you and good night. Thank you to all. That was a great meeting. Thank you. It was a marathon. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. Good night, all. Drive safely, Michael. Good evening, Your Worship. Thank you. Remember, you're in Burford. <laughs> good night. Good night. Later. Good night. <laughs>